Hello and welcome back to another episode of Wise Words Book Summaries. Today we are doing Functional Training and Beyond by Adam Sinicki. Kind of along the same trend of our like health and fitness, although to be fair, it's been a while, but you know, it's been summer, yeah. we've been busy. Um, this book very much goes into depth about uh, functional training, you know, as it says on the tin. And I think we've kind of been gravitating towards this different perspective of fitness for both of us, I think to a degree. Mm -hmm. I mean, like we've been into calisthenics a bit and changing up like what we do at the gym. It's less about aesthetics and it's more about like, okay, let's see strength as a function or mobility as a function. And so we've yeah. kind of been gravitating towards it. But I think what's also funny, like after I've read this book, I, I'd almost convinced myself that I always held this belief. And I was like, God, yeah, yeah people yeah. who do, you know, go to the gym for aesthetics. And it was like almost hindsight bias. Like I already knew this stuff, which is bullshit. Yeah. But, but I, I, I feel like to some degree, we we all kind of know that maybe, you know, just going to the gym and just doing like 12 sets of chest every time you go and not like, you know, not sort of being negligent towards other body parts, for example, is like, yeah. like a classic gym routine that most uh, males probably have in particular. Um, yeah. but this kind of like, and we've always almost criticized ourselves for that. Like we always yeah. joke about, you know, missing leg day and stuff. Yeah, and to yeah. be honest, this isn't the point of the book, like is in doing legs. It's more like training other aspects of fitness that you don't even think about, which I thought was so interesting, you know, like mobility. 100%. And he yeah. talks a lot about like twisting as well. Like we don't train to twist. We kind yeah. of train to be like static, standing, pushing above our heads, pushing forward, but like not moving our sort of core trunk. Yeah. Um, and yeah, like it's one of those things that like you read it and you kind of think, oh, I always knew that. Like I feel like yeah. we all do deep down know there's like yeah, yeah, exactly. Any routines, um, it's just not something that we've maybe been able to articulate or have a plan to sort of change. You know? Yeah, yeah. I I think like we've fallen into this kind of aesthetic perspective of fitness, mm -hmm. which means that we've kind of neglected this like how do we actually work in real life like how do we move in real life why don't we just do stuff that kind of replicates that and for some reason we we don't it's like how often do you do like a bicep curl for you know, yeah three sets of 12 and, it's just, it's and obviously kind of funny. by aesthetics what you mean is obviously just like purely for looks right like we kind of yes. like focus yeah. on the gym and the gym and sorry all our training we kind of do is focused around creating the sort of you know perfect body or the chiseled abs or the beef yeah. the beefcake depending what you you know what you're going for yeah. but yeah like you said we we really miss out on like yeah, like is this actually functional? Like, is this like is this something we actually use day to day? Like you said, do you, you don't often find yourself doing bicep curls, and yeah. even if you do, right? For example, like you know when you train bicep uh, biceps, normally you do like a barbell curl where you're using both at the same time. One of I think Adam Snicky's main points is that we often use one arm at a time when we're yeah. in, in real life, and I thought that's so interesting because like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I personally try to incorporate a lot of um, uh, one arm into my training. So like if you're doing cables and stuff, instead of just doing both at the same time, you, you very rarely find yourself like, you know, pulling down both yeah, arms yeah. at the same time as either yeah. one or the other. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of one of his main points, like to try and mimic movements that actually occur in real life. So therefore you're, you know, prepared for real life and not just prepared to look good. Yeah. Um, yeah. A hundred percent. It's a massive mindset shift really, isn't it? If you think about it, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's almost like a, I don't know, it's tackling like what you value, but also what is valuable in its sense, right? Like in itself. So it's valuable to be able to be functional and like to move around and be able to like, you know, you can do things that actually um, support well being and, and health and fitness. Whereas like the, what we the everyday life, like, right? For example. Yeah, like, exactly. If you're picking up something from the floor, right? It's teaching yeah. the correct techniques and the correct muscles to like sort of flex at the time right you know like you're like, something as simple as picking something up off, off up the floor you need to sort of bend your legs you need to twist your like core put your arm down then pull it back up you know it's stuff like that which you, you're just not training that in the gym how often no. do you ever pick something up off the floor apart from doing maybe like a like a, um, a row let's just say with like a dumbbell but even then you're like sort of isolating it just up and down not from the side for example when it's never like you know sort of linear when you're doing lifts in real life yeah 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 but I think and our the shape, society... and the shapes of things are always weird. Like you don't, you don't just have like a perfect barbell shape that you're picking up, right? Like, because yeah. I think mean, one of his main points as well is he loves to talk about like sandbags and stuff, stuff where the the gravity sh uh, or like the weights or shifts across like a plane, and it's not yeah. just as simple as like oh the weights always just down here like in a linear way, it, like moves as you pick it up. And I think yeah. that's a really interesting point. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it is, it is. And I, so we should probably just 
Yeah, let's just get straight into it. Do you want to start us off? Yeah, cool. So the first chapter was welcome to functional training. So as we just said, when people focus on a particular fitness goal, they can end up doing so at the expense of other fitness requirements. As they grow more and more with their chosen sport or program, investing time in their chosen hobby and becoming a part of the community, they might well adopt a tribal mindset. They might cover their particular form of training at the expense of all others. So one of the biggest issues with the current approach to training is that it's so tribal. Each approach to training has its diehard fans who would tell you that their way is superior above all others. And I mean, with this type of thing, you could just think of like stuff like CrossFit, Calisthenics. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Everybody thinks their way of training is, you know, the sort of the gold standard yeah, yeah. for either, you know, getting an incredible physique or becoming the strongest per like, you know, the strongest person you can be. Um, but it like, like, one of the main points I think from this book as well, like that, that you should think about is like, if you just pick one way of training, you're going to, you know, build up that physique around that way of training, but you're going to miss out on all the other things. So like, if you're just training, like weight training, like we said at the beginning and not doing any mobility, you can find you're going to be really strong. Maybe that's depends if you're training heavy, right? But you're yeah. going to lose out on all the mobility benefits of training in sort of if, if, if like calisthenics, for example. Right. And it's one so, of those things that he's trying to really stamp on here is like, trying to be flexible with your mindset and not just sort of sticking to one over the others. Like yeah. find obviously you can spec like um specialize in a specific type of weight training or gy like a gym routine. But his point is you should then look to other um areas to sort of balance yourself a little bit and obviously yeah, yeah. those areas that aren't being hit. Yeah. Um, no, exactly. And I think it, I think we fall into this and it's quite like a Western attitude, but like we have to be ambitious at whatever we do. We have to be great at whatever we try to do. And so, you know, trying specializing in one thing. OK, fine. If you're going to go and become like an athlete or, you know, um, or like an Olympic athlete. Right. But you can understand why that person would focus purely on just that kind of type of fitness, because that's what they're competing in. But for mm -hmm. most people, the average person, we're not going to be competing in it. So yeah. why not try and work on multiple different um, facets of like fitness? And that way you're much better on average than 99% of the people. OK, but also you you just have a more holistic like kind of grounding in fitness. You're not just like focusing just on one and then neglecting this. And then this ends up like, you know, become debilitating. It's I think it's I think that's a very good like attitude to like start to take on. Um, yeah. just this thing that you don't have to specialize and be like the best at whatever, but you could be pretty good at a number of different areas. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like, um, I guess what we do in our pursuit of like reading loads of books is like, fine, you can specialize like in specific things like economics, you can specialize mm -hmm. psychology, whatever, but it's always good to sort of explore other fields and pick up really good ideas from them to sort of, you know, to be, I guess, more creative, mm -hmm. but also being to see the synergy between between different like fields, right? Yeah, it's kind of absolutely. similar in fitness in the sense, like you're you're trying to pick the best ideas and the best training protocols from different areas to build around like the the not the perfect, but like the best all round physique for yourself, right? Like yeah. in a sense that it's not just it looks good, but it's functional. You're strong. You're not going to have any issues in the future. Do you get if you kind of get what I mean? Like you're yeah, trying yeah, to yeah, as absolutely. many boxes as possible, and maybe you don't excel. Like you just said, you don't excel and become like the strongest man ever, or you don't excel and become, I don't know, the the biggest guy in the gym. But at the end of the day, you've you've got something more than the biggest guy in the gym has. Like you have yeah. the ability to like scratch your own back, for example. Yeah, 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 <laughs> the yeah, bodybuilders yeah. you can't like scratch your own back, right? <laughs> yeah. It's that type of thing. Yeah. So like you'll be able to scratch your own back, you'll be able to touch your toes, you'll be able to sprint, um, you know, all these things that like you can't really put sort of value on, apart from maybe in your old age when you realize that you're sort of like, you know. Uh, what's the word? Like, not, I was going to say dying. <laughs> so uh, bit, we'll good. we'll do it at some point. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but you know what yeah. I mean. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, exactly. So yeah, I'll just continue this bit. So yeah, so limiting yourself to a single form of training is unnecessarily restrictive. Every system of training is something to offer. Offer, sorry. Likewise, there's no single style of training that can possibly cover the entire gamut of what constitutes fitness. True functionality comes from versatility and variety. It comes from being able to thrive in any situation. This demands a multidisciplinary approach. By leveling up every aspect of your brain and body, you can increase the number of possibilities available to you. And, that's, and, yeah, and I think, just to add on this, and I think he does maybe touch on it in the book, but people who go to the gym, they fall into this um, kind of very standard way of thinking like oh if i do this then it's going to you know impact my results here right it's, my it's, gains it's, classic, isn't it? it's cardio isn't it it's yeah, always like exactly. if, I, if i do a run at the end of my weight training session yeah. i'm gonna lose my gains yeah. yeah yeah and it's it realistically it's not that simple um 
I mean, if you're once again, if you're training to compete and then you basically just have a trade off and you put time towards cardio, then maybe it will impact that. Right. But for most people, it's not going to have such a debilitating effect and you can improve sl slower. Right. But still improving at both of those different areas. Um, yeah. But it is something that so many people are like, oh, I can't do cardio at the moment because, you know, I I'm doing this. Yeah. I was going to say to you, I think you've touched on the point there, which is it it can be slower and it logically makes sense and it might be slower. So, like, obviously, if you're diverting resources to two different adaptions in your body, so one of them cardio based and one of them, you know, strength based, yeah. it makes sense because you only have a certain amount of calories per day to, like, to put into these two different aspects of adaption, right, that you're going to uh, increase slower maybe across the board yeah. but then you can do stuff like we've spoke about with uh, ross edgy where you can do um what's the word cycles you know like meso cycles and stuff you can yeah. cycle this type of stuff as well you can like have a cardio focus couple of months you can have a strength focus couple of months you know this type of thing like there's no reason why you can't just bolt it on or create like a you know like a focus for a few months and then just go after that goal then yeah. rest for a few months and go after that goal again you know yeah um but yeah 100 um yeah. So moving on to the next chapter. So why we need to go beyond regular training. Training for aesthetics is not the same as training for function. For most of us, it is better to be an all-rounder, to be highly capable in every physical cognitive attribute in order to deal with unpredictable circumstances. You may not be an Olympic contender, but you can be better than 99.9% .9 of the population at pretty much everything. Since dopamine also helps meditate, uh, mediate attention and focus, this effects also bleeds over into general motivation, awareness and brain function. Being less functional reduces your opportunities for development. When you stop receiving that information as a result of having less options, you eventually cull the relevant neural pathways. In other words, you lose the ability to receive that proprioceptive receptive feedback, even when it's available. This, is not this not only causes us to move incorrectly, it also reduces the amount of information coming into the brain. Loss of sensory information may even be linked with dementia. And this is something that like he kind of touches on a lot. And it's probably the first book, like fitness book, where I've seen them try to incorporate like brain training as well. He kind of talks mm. about that because he's essentially saying the link between the, the brain and the body is so strong that like, you know, if you're improving sensory reception and proprioception then that's also going to link to your body and so your body's going to be able to deal with it much better um and vice versa and i that was one area of the book that i didn't think was as strong of an argument but i do understand the concept of it um i do yeah i do understand like it, i think it's it's very easy to be like oh if i work on this area then it will bleed over to everything but it's not as specific, it's, that's too simple, right? There's probably, it's quite complex. Um, but I did like that he touched on it. I thought it was was an interesting point. Um, yeah. So I, I was just looking quickly then at something because I've noticed something since I've torn my ACL. Mm -hmm. And it's, I, I was just looking to see if your, um, the ligament contains um, like receptors, obviously from your brain signals. Because basically yeah. I found from the moment I tore the ACL the other day that, I really struggled to move my leg properly. Like I literally, uh, okay, really? as, much, as much as I will it, I, I just don't have the same strength. Mm. And it kind of makes sense if you think of your breath, like as a pathway, right? It probably goes through the ligament to allow you to sort of like send certain like muscle contractions, right? In my head, mm. at least it makes sense. That'd be one of the communication mechanisms. But like, I found it really hard to like use my quads. Yeah. Like, out of nowhere, just from snapping this, 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 this sort of feedback. Yeah. Um, so that kind of that kind of makes sense that like you you need to train your mind to use your muscles, right? And so yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Part of the recovery of this injury is to literally train your mind to find a new way to send the signals to the muscles. Yeah, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it makes sense that if you don't use them over periods of time, that you lose the ability. Like, I think I've seen people talk about stupid things like controlling, you know, like your eyebrows, controlling your ears. Yeah. Like you've lost the ability to like move your ears like this or yeah. no. Not, you know what I mean? Like doing the, know, yeah, 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 the, yeah. the Cabri advert, for example, right? Like if you, if you think and train hard enough, you can almost yeah. control many aspects of your body that you never had any clue yeah. that you can control. Right. Yeah. And this is, it's kind of linked to this where it's like, you, you can train it. If, if it's like on your body, you can kind of train it, but it just requires like dedication. Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Um, and there's a really good point later on that he talks about how we've designed our environment to be easier but because of that, our bodies have suffered because now we yeah. don't, we no longer have to crawl or, 
you know, crouch or move in any like particular way other than like walking and sitting. Um, and even the way we sit, I mean, we talked about in exercise that it's not the greatest way to do it, but, um, yeah. So moving on. So we have designed, Oh, he literally says it here. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. We have designed our environment to be convenient and easy to navigate, meaning our adaptable nature will regress rather than develop. It's not like navigating a jungle and constantly problem solving a path. Ironically, by developing our environment, we ourselves have become less developed. Your current capabilities are what uh, are what put a are what put a limit on your potential and possibilities available to you. Always do what you've always done, and you'll always get what you've always got. I quite like that little um, quote at the end there. <laughs> but um, I think the thing that I liked about his kind of quote about the environment was the idea that it when you're in the jungle, you have to problem solve. And so you are always kind of like stimulated. Your brain is always stimulated to try and find like, okay, how am I going to navigate this? How do I get over this rock? How do I get around this tree? Blah, 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 blah. And now we've kind of reduced all that kind of complexity. Um, and as a response, we're not as stimulated when we just go from A to B. And a lot of the time we do the same exact routine every day. So it's kind of just ingrained, but um, I just thought it was an interesting concept. This bringing in this problem solving, like, um, brain stimulation aspect to it I, I do wonder why that's the popularity of video games as well like we spoke a few times mm. video games, like pop, the popularity is the the stimulation with the fact that you, you're constantly pro problem solving in video games and progressing you know kind of thing so yeah. our, and like you said our lives kind of lack that now because everything's been so simplified to this is what you should do this is where you should go and you kind of like walk through life as like a zombie almost because you're yeah. you know you're missing that uh what's the word like it is, I guess it is problem solving. It's like making decisions, like sort mm. of living, living off the fly. I feel like you almost feel alive the most when you're sort of making split second decisions, a bit of adrenaline kind of thing, a bit like when you play sports, right? Well, you're, you're focused, um, aren't you? I think yeah. that's something, right? Like we can, we can be off in when, when I'm walking to work or whatnot, you know, I could be thinking about anything, but when I have to be engaged because I have to solve a problem, then my attention is on something I'm focused. And it's kind of, I think we lack that in today's society very much for multiple mm. reasons, but um yeah it's the same thing with like using your phone instead like i used to love remembering where i was you know geographically and then being able to navigate my way through a city but now it's just so easy to just get up google maps and be like oh it's just mm. but then i actually don't remember where that route right whereas should, i would have remembered to, right? it. yeah yeah exactly yeah um yeah so on to the next chapter Yes. So what is super functional training? Uh, the functional training definition. So training for the demands of a given event. This includes training that might supplement the practice skills, but also prehabilitation pre to avoid injury. Functional training involves seven primal movements. So one is push. One is, uh, uh, sorry, number two is pull. Three is squat. Four is lunge. Five is bend. Six is twist. And seven is gait. However, this list is not comprehensive in describing human movement. For example, it does not incorporate the different planes of motion, the vertical and horizontal components, which is you know what we train mainly in the gym, yeah. and the variations and derivatives of these movements. A focus should be put on combining these movements and move and between moving them freely. So I thought that's quite an interesting point yeah. because we, you know, when you're training in the gym, you kind of just do one thing or the other. Sorry, right? You're just pushing or you're pulling yeah. or you're, you know it's never really like you're never doing a push into the pool i mean sometimes people do those exercises like with, when you do sort of like crossfit and stuff and you're doing like yeah. clean and jerks you're pulling up and then you're pushing yeah. oh, this is why i feel like people sort of love the sort of crossfit where it's combining actual for like free-flowing movements yeah. and not just like up down up down i mean Absolutely. there comes a point where that comes a bit tedious right um i think those transition periods are really important to work on and I, I i've started to really understand the importance of doing like kind of animal flows or animal movements because how do you how do i react if i like catch a ball and i have to stumble backwards right but normally i would never train that movement that transition of like you know going like that in between certain main main movements you're probably a bit weaker and i feel like if you train those and that's where people end up injuring themselves right they move when like you know they they move like like you in football or yeah, yeah. you they move your knee in a particular way and you're not used to moving it in that, in that and, and you put enough force through it and then absolutely you just get them over yeah 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 um, yeah that's 
literally it. So there are a number of training systems that attempt to train some of these movements, including kettlebell training, calisthenics, parkour, XMA, animal flow, like you just said, more than that, gymnastics and strength training. Then there is functional training itself, which is the purposeful introduction of movements designed to strengthen human movement patterns. Therefore, if we choose the right movement patterns to begin with, we don't need corrective exercise. So super functional training. If functional training means training for the functions required by life or by specific sports and activities, super functional training means training to do more than is required of you. Just as the MMA fighter cherry picks the most useful movements from any and all the martial arts, so too can we choose the best moves and strategies from disparate styles of physical training. Bruce Lee again, absorb what is useful, reject what is useless, add what is essentially your own. And this is, yeah, like it's just, it's the same principle with, like we just said, with like books and knowledge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, 100%. Yeah. Learn the best ideas from all the different disciplines. Learn the best functional movements out of all, or like learn the best ways to train across all the different disciplines of training, right? Mm. And incorporate them all into one sort of, yeah, super functional training program, right? Like yeah. it just, it kind of makes sense. Like, yeah. Always you're going to have um, deficiencies. And I, I actually just looking at what you just said there as well with the seven like components, I forgot about the gate. The yeah. gate for me was completely just off. You know, I wasn't even thinking about gate, but of course, that's probably what caused my injury. <laughs> <laughs> Genuinely. But like, oh, God. It's these type of things that you never, um, I just don't know, You just it's never part of a, a normal gym routine. No, like if exactly. somebody says to you, where do you go and work out? It's very much push, pull, yep. legs, splits, all these sort of type of ways, just doing the very much the same sort of vertical, horizontal planes of motion. Yeah. Um, you know, obviously, like we said, the CrossFit has now become more popular, and some some of these all all these other like alternative training styles in my head have also yeah. become very popular recently. But once again, this always happens when people realize something's missing from like the standard uh, way of doing things, or like yeah, the mainstream. You know? Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. It, it is it, it, exactly. It's it, the thing is, I think it requires you to just educate yourself on fitness which you know if we came straight from school where everyone at school does the mainstream like working out right it's not like you're told by teachers or taught by people even in pe you're not really taught that much about this kind of stuff right um and so it requires you because you wouldn't know anything about these kinds of fits like i've never heard of half of these mov nat you know move nat yeah, yeah. um xma like uh, even animal flow it's like i came across them like you know a few years ago but prior to that i'd never even heard of them and they seem so weird that you're like oh no this seems like some kind of alternative yeah. like form of fitness a bit this guy's odd. crawling like, on the floor on the gym look at him yeah. Loser. Yeah. Yeah, yeah funnily enough he's probably the healthiest of, yeah. of all yeah, of them yeah. you know um yeah. yeah so i think i think it is very important to kind of educate yourself on these matters um yes. So this next bit is the ability tree. And this is kind of something that he refers to in how to um, kind of structure functional training to a degree. So um, how do we select the best exercises for the intended goal? So the ATSP hierarchy, which is specific physical attributes, traits, skills, and techniques, technique proficiencies. That's what it stands for. So skills are the component that relies on technique. Traits, these are the force multipliers that amplify the output from a consistent input. So by isolating and specifically training traits, we can increase the challenge and thereby trigger more profound adaptations. Um, and then the specific physical attributes, these underpin traits and pertain to an individual's biology. So they are also things we can target specifically with the right exercises. They expose the areas that we need to focus on and therefore the exercises and programming that will provide the best results. I was, I was going to add, there's only a few things, like, for example, height. There's a few things you can't yes, of course, train, yeah. but yeah. there is obviously parts of your biology that you can train, such as muscle size, you know, muscle, like your body composition, for example, you can change through diet and exercise. So. Exactly, exactly. So because that's a bit abstract, let's give an example. So a baseball example. So the skill is the baseball swing. So the traits here, so things relevant to the baseball swing are explosive rotational strength, precise motor control, hand-eye coordination, endurance, etc. So then the specific physical attributes that you can, that are the underlying um, aspects. So someone who has explosive rotational power can also be said to have a high density of fast twitch fibers in the torso, specific lo specifically located in obliques, serratus, and anterior rhomboids or a high level of inter and intramuscular coordination, meaning they can access this explosive strength. 
So essentially, you're just diving in, right? The resolution is getting more, uh, um, more high definition. You're able to hit those underpinning kind of like um, fundamentals that then kind of help those traits, and then that trait helps that skill. Um, so therefore, we can use the ATSP system to break down any sport into its specific skills, underlying traits, and specific physical attributes. However, knowledge of the intended sport is required so you know what to break it into. Essentially, by choosing a goal first, you can then work backwards to find the best forms of training. And that kind of is exactly what we were just saying before, like the ed educating yourself is really important. And we've kind of done this with like take running for example right yeah we look at the biomechanics of running how the feet work you know then we started to get into the kind of like vivo shoes and so you can start to train the like those kind of specific um specific physical attributes and then you can train those traits and then the actual skill in itself um yeah so one last point here there comes a point of diminishing returns. Is being able to squat 200 kilos that much more useful than being able to squat 180 kilos? <laughs> when is that ever necessary in daily life? Bit of a random quote, but... Um, no, no, but it makes sense. Holds, it's, holds it's, merit, doesn't it? it's, it's one of those thought like exercises that you know people don't really think about. It's like, oh yeah, I want to bench 150 kilograms. Yeah. Okay, but why? Like apart from obviously yeah. your, your ego, like there's no functional reason why you need that in your day-to-day -day life right unless you're stuck under 150 kg boulder <laughs> that yeah. you need to push off you yeah, right yeah, yeah. which is a very rare occurrence so why not be you know let's just reduce that goal to something maybe like 100 or 120 something that's still really good but then focus on developing other areas where you're like you're sound across the board right rather than mm -hmm. just really strong in one specific way yeah um and that's what i thought resonated with me the most with this like you know the entire book really it's like we do have this sort of like society where we sort of like I don't know. I guess it is more aesthetics than actually the strength stuff. But we focus on one sole goal. And we we sort of lose out on all the potential benefits of following these other different paths. Hmm. You know? I think it can also kid us into thinking that we are improving in other areas. Like because we have yeah. such a narrow filter of what our goal is, that like, oh yes, okay, I'm I've just gone up two and a half kilos on my bench, but we don't want to look at the other areas because we don't want to face the fact that we haven't yeah. done any you can, animal but you can chase or, aesthetics at the, at, yeah. the, at the expense of maybe like destroying so other parts of your body like you've got a really bad back because you've been training wrong the whole yeah. time or you've taken like i don't know some drugs to like get you to that point and then you've like damaged yourself right like, it's like this never-ending pursuit for one thing and not focusing on the holistic yeah. approach to it like yeah like you can still have the thing you want maybe it takes a bit longer but you develop other areas and then you're you once again you're super functional yeah. in real life like you can pick stuff up without any issues you can play every sport because although there's that obviously like the hierarchy of the skills proficiencies and you know underlying physical traits i think we've said this many times before at the very base there is a few physical traits that just translate across yeah, yeah. every sport right like really good cardiovascular health that's yeah. going to help you in pretty yeah, much yeah. all sports right a decent level of like muscular endurance is also yeah. going to help you across all sports right movement planes like if you can move in all different types of directions that's also going to help you in most sports right not all yeah. but most right and it translates across and you might even find that in my head at least if you've trained in a way that maybe is not directly beneficial to your sport it could end up being something that makes you have a competitive advantage because nobody mm. else is training it do you get what yeah. i mean like um like it requires jumping like yeah. for example in football obviously people know you need to head but I, apart from people like Cristiano ronaldo where you see this guy literally just yeah, leap flying. above everybody yeah, else yeah. right once again like not everybody's probably like they are training to jump but like he's taking it to like you know the sort of next yeah. level sort of thing i think i wonder if it's also you know we gravitate towards forms of fitness that are easier to track and therefore compete yeah. or compare so like aesthetics mm. is one, right? Like you can obviously, you could see a visible difference. And so there's that element of competition. That's why people gravitate towards that. Or like strength, it's easy to like kind of measure and then compare with others. Whereas like other things where like, you know, you're doing an animal movement or you're trying to do, I don't know, some variation of a calisthenic exercise, it's harder to measure. And so... Mm -hmm. it requires a lot of self-discipline to be like no i know that if i put in the work i'll be able to get there eventually yeah. even if i don't have some measure that can you know track it yeah you know um, um it's like doing like a farmer's walk or something you know like putting yeah. your weights and just walking around with like weights on you um 
I mean, obviously there are small sort of things you can, you can try and you can, sort of like yeah. quantify, right? We, we've talked about this before. Like you can either try and increase the weight or whatever you're holding, yeah. or you can try and increase the amount of steps, the amount of time, you know, there is, there you is can always deconstruct you're right. it, but yeah. yes, but it's harder to do than obviously it, it requires more thought than, yeah. okay, I'm just going to slap on five kg on this, on this yeah. barbell and exactly. it's gone up five kg. Yeah. Therefore, you know, I've improved whatever, like yeah, yeah. reps and weight are like the most basic metrics for like improvement right but there yeah. are so many more we said this before like rest time you mm-hmm. can even do um you know the speed of contraction or like mm-hmm. the, the speed of the the full contraction right like you're doing three seconds down f- like five seconds up whatever but yeah. like, there's so many different variables and it's almost like that's where people get o- almost maybe scared with the the complexity that can come involved yeah. with doing this so that they all, all, always default back to the you know uh, add 2.5 kg to the to the barbell and there's nothing wrong with that right like if you're making yeah. progress and stuff but i think you could be right there with um you know people seem to like focus and do the stuff that's the easiest to compare and measure yeah i do, I do think that is the case well there's um, an element of like you know that kind of social reputation on the line isn't there that uh, almost an evolutionary perspective that you don't want to be doing something random in front of a bunch of people at a gym. That's, that's one thing. <laughs> yeah. And then, yeah. and realistically, most people I feel like get into the gym kind of I, maybe around school, but like you're so uneducated mm. about it. You know, nothing about, you know, mm. it's, it's easy to slip into that kind of form of fitness. I think. I, I wonder if it's so on the same, like for, I wonder if it's best to start out with the simplicity, right? Like for, for somebody starting out, right? Like yeah. the idea of just racking up more weight on a barbell or more weight on the dumbbell, whatever, whatever you're doing and yeah. focusing on increasing weight, increasing reps is a very like, you know, good way to start into fitness. And then obviously yeah. once you get into it, then it becomes a point of like, now we can introduce the complexity. Now we yeah. can talk about more uh, complex ideas or more complex ways of quantifying your performance, such as, you know, you can even do stuff like, you know, we, we talked about stuff before, like isometrics and stuff yeah. where you just do, do holds. You're not even just doing full reps. You're doing, in fact, is isometrics the hold? It is, isn't it? The hold, I yeah. Believe. Yeah. What's concentric and then eccentric is when you go down, right? So concentric's going up and then eccentric's down. Concentric even, is contracting, essentially. Yeah, contracting and eccentric. Yeah, exactly. So then, like, this, we've spoke about before, like, even do building into, like, eccentric movements into your workout. So, like, yeah. all you're doing is focusing on the eccentric and going heavier. Yeah. Like, there's all these things you can do which, like, changes the variables of workouts yeah which are slightly more complicated but once again it's like you can't it's like riding a bike without stabilizers i guess to some degree mm. it's you need to understand the basics first and then because yeah. obviously the basics are the progressive overload like it's the quantifying something and then trying to add more of it over time yeah but then you realize you can actually choose different variables to do the progressive so, overload it, right and that's where exactly i think it becomes a bit more interesting but also yeah. like you said harder to measure or harder to maybe notice a difference. Well, I'm, but I'm I, still doing the I, same weight, but I'm doing more time, or I'm doing the same weight, but I'm doing less rest. It just doesn't yeah. feel the same as I'm doing more weight. You know? No, it's true, but I think you can almost abstract the learning process in itself. And I think that's why gym is actually, or working out, is so important for people because it is a simple for- physical form and visual form of feedback, right? Like mm-hmm. I put in effort, I get a result, whether that's with strength, you're going up two and a half kilos a week, or whether you're, you're just getting bigger, like muscular wise. I think it teaches people who haven't co- quite, you know, grasped that kind of learning mechanism that, okay, I can then apply this to anything. And I mm. like, I kind of felt that like I was someone who went to the gym, I didn't really know what I was doing, but like, I enjoyed it. And then I was like, Oh, wow, okay, I can start to like, you know, tweak this or tweak that, like you said, change the parameters find different properties about it that you want to like um improve that and then that kind of takes you on this kind of learning journey towards like okay well maybe there is and it's exactly where we are now right like we're reading about function and we've yeah, always yeah, kind yeah. Of, yeah. yeah and and that's the thing is like it it is a learning journey in itself and i think a lot of people should be part of that because it is an important one yeah i was even gonna add something maybe something along the lines as well of being not dissatisfied but never being satisfied with the results we start thinking Mm. outside the box be like fine we've been training this way for years like we've seen some progress don't get me wrong but we got to the point where like okay it's still not taking us to the next level maybe there is something more to this kind of thing you know Um, yeah it's that problem solving once again yeah once again, there it is. So let's move on to the next chapter, which I believe we've got a lot of yellow. So the science of movement and strength. So this chapter, we purposefully sort of, we're going to gloss over a little bit because 
we've covered all these sort of topics before in some of the other podcasts like exercised um some of the ross edgley books we've done as well yeah um involves you know types of types of muscle contractions uh the, the way we move um and this will all be put on the book summary so if you're listening to the podcast you can check out the book summary and see the details we just don't think it's you know worth going through every single time yeah but we will go should we should we go over the stuff that is left under so we got yeah uh we got some some muscle contractions right so we're not going to get into the muscle fibers like usual but every muscle is made of hundreds of thousands of tiny muscle fibers these are collected into groups called motor units and each motor unit is controlled innovated by a single nerve which in turn is controlled by a single motor, uh, motor neuron in the motor cortex this means a nerve cannot cause a singular muscle cell to contract rather it will control the entire group the motor unit the signals are binary that is to say the motor unit either contracts or it does not to that end our motor neurons are an excitation uh, have an excitation threshold i thought that's quite an interesting point actually, yeah today, isn't it that you can't just contract one single fiber by itself no exactly um, and yeah so for example if one nearby neuron should stimulate another this might not be enough to cause the signal to continue depending on how sensitive it is thus depending on the strength of the signal you send to your bicep so subjectively perceived as effort determines whether you recruit a greater or smaller proportion of your motor units to complete the curl so yeah this is kind of like if you get into the nitty-gritty of like training in your one rep max percentages right so if yeah. you're training at like a hundred percent of your you know maximum strength you're yeah, going to yeah. be recruiting all the motor units in your in your bicep let's just say if you're doing curls yeah, yeah. whereas obviously if you're training at a lighter weight you might be you know only doing 50 60 percent of that yeah and i think it's interesting because we never really contemplate that once again back when you went to the gym at the beginning you're not even thinking of these like percentage yeah. terms of like am i training at 70 percent, 80 percent what am yeah, i yeah. you know which threshold am i in right but it's quite important to know that obviously in my head at least if you're going to make the gains or to to go past a certain threshold you're going to need to make sure you're training more than like 60 70 percent of them like yeah. aggressively if that makes sense yeah yeah absolutely and it's, it's interesting because I remember coming across this once years ago and it was kind of trying to explain like drop sets because okay. you're not, you're not um, contracting all of your uh, you know, muscular units essentially. Um, you're doing the damage, aren't you, through the sort of build up of lactic acid and stuff like that's the yeah. metabolic damage, right? Remember, the, was it exercise he talks about it? So it's like not the fibril damage, but it's the metabolic damage caused yeah. by i think uh, yeah right. there are three components actually i think it yeah. touches on it in this. <laughs> um, yeah so yeah last yeah, last point on this um there you go yeah we actually tap into a very small portion of our latent strength at any given time this holds true even when endeavoring to lift your maximal weight in a single repetition typically estimated at approximately 30 percent for the average individual this threshold can escalate to as much as 50 percent for highly trained uh athletes so yeah, is that just completely destroying what I said a minute ago? I'm just trying to get um, around it. it, isn't it? It's saying that you only ever use thirty percent of your strength. Is that what kind of what? It's yes, saying? I think yeah. That's why. Like, have you seen these people who kind of um, uh, Do they, like, they almost like get arm? an electric okay. shock to okay, try yeah, and get yeah. the hundred percent? Um, and it's which is kind of. I, nuts. I wonder if that's like a body defense mechanism. So like, it's obviously stopping you from going past a certain maybe uh, potentially like muscle damaging like like a catastrophic muscle damaging you know if you're using 100 yeah. percent, like there's a chance that you're just gonna absolutely just it's like it's, snap it or something you know it's interesting though it's like why would we have an evolution mechanism that like we never use Ooh. however though just on that point yeah there are examples yes although it's guy, anecdotal like, yeah of yeah. like people having super strength in yeah. situations like a like car, a car falls on someone and yeah, yeah exactly and so that's a good it point. is weird, but like maybe there's like a certain signal from like adrenaline or some something that comes because obviously they yeah. didn't test. It would be unethical to test these situations where somebody thinks they're life threatened no, in, course, a, in yeah, a laboratory, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. But there is a potential chance that maybe these like um, these signals increase the the amount that you actually use. Maybe, maybe that's yeah, what maybe you need like an emotional response to be able mm. to tap into like the lat latent um strength that you have but it's just it's interesting to con think of it from like an evolutionary perspective why we have these but um yeah, yeah. fascinating um yeah funny <laughs> so cool. this next bit so muscle fiber types we've we kind of talked about a lot you know there's um kind of two types and then there's like a hybrid depending on how you train it can kind of adapt 
to a certain degree, but different muscles hold different muscle um, ratios of muscle types. Um, but uh, here, so motor units inherently consist predominantly of a singular muscle fiber type, notably those, cons um, those constituted by type 2A and type 2X fibers exhibit both large dimensions and higher cell counts. So those are the ones that are more prone to like hypertrophy when you like build a lot of muscle. Mm -hmm. Additionally, they exhibit an elevated excitation threshold. Consequently, a feeble um, signal not only activates a diminished number of motor units, but also selectively triggers those, compo uh, those composed of slower twitch fibers. Conversely, a potent signal engages not only the smaller motor units, but also an array of the larger ones. So depending on the kind of how heavy, for instance, you're lifting, how many kind of like motor units it yeah. needs to engage. Um, and I guess that's why, so training like maybe like powerlifting trains both to a degree, right? Because you're, you're engaging all of your kind of like type two muscle fibers, but also some of the slower ones as well. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that's why like a sort of balanced training program where you do a bit of strength and a bit of sort of like higher repetitions can train like both kind of thing. Mm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, this is called Henneman's size principle, which tells us that the body will recruit motor units in order of size and will only recruit as many as is necessary for that action. At lower levels of force, we actually have far more precise control over our movement. As we exert more force, the step ch uh, change becomes larger. I think that's I mean, quite interesting, actually. I think I think we kind of um, what's the word? We experienced that. I don't know. I was going to say this earlier when it comes to like the motor neurons, and you know how you're sort of saying like it's either off or on. But then mm. there comes a point where I feel like when it's like, for example, when it comes to like writing, you have like the dexterity of your hand, like because yes. there's no like force Precisely. stopping you, right? You can feel like these like really small intricate motions. But if at the moment I have like a massive force here, yeah, I can't like you know I'm doing my hands going all over the place, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. pushing against the force and I can't stop it once that force gives away yeah um and that's that why i guess sense. it emphasized the importance of you know when you're starting out doing an exercise start mm -hmm. low weight and yeah. to really understand the form and ha really like embed that and then you can start to once that's kind of yeah. mapped then you can yeah, somewhat increase you, yeah, the weight because you can't control the form once you're yeah i was about to say no, it, no. for example if i yeah uh, if i was doing a bench let's just say and i went to towards my one rep max i am putting everything i can just to put yeah, 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 yeah. thing up right but if i'm lighter i can like take my time you know you can kind of like adjust you know you can adjust you can make adjustments as you go but when you're obviously super heavy it's like you're using everything there's no there's no uh spare muscle fibers to help you adjust the direction yeah, yeah. so it's like up or down exactly um, exactly um yeah cool. so do you want to go this on is, to the next bit yeah so hypertrophy and strength gains so the body doesn't see a difference between acceleration and strength it all just amounts to force Either way, a strong signal is being sent to recruit lots of big, uh, lots of big motor units. And I'm going to go over these. I know these are in yellow, but the three main stimuli that signal hypertrophy are mechanical tension. So this entails the actual perceptual tension within the muscle by mechanoreceptors or mechanosensory neurons. When the muscle ex executes potent contractions, this stimulus triggers the release of growth factors like myokines. Then there's muscle damage. So muscle damage results from microtrauma to fibers akin to an elastic band slightly fraying. The body responds by fortifying tissue to prevent further harm with the most significant damage occurring in the eccentric exercise phase, as we were talking about before. Mm. Um, and then metabolic stress. So performing 12 repetitions of dumbbell curls triggers vasodilation and metabolic stimulation, directing blood flow to the muscle. Muscle contractions induce an occlusion effect that captures and pulls blood, bathing the muscle in growth factors and promoting cellular swelling for enhanced growth. This seems to be increased most in the concentric phase. So there you go. You've got the three different ways here and as we were just saying before so potentially it's you know the way you train when you're doing high repetitions is more this sort of metabolic stress that you're causing yeah. and metabolic um you know what well, gets blood flow to the muscles is increasing the amount of growth factors around them yeah, yeah. um it kind of these things make logical sense to some degree right like in terms they of you know, tearing coming back stronger and then obviously metabolic stress sort of increasing the amount of um of, yeah growth factors or growth hormones or whatever hanging around your muscles yeah it does it does make sense and then sorry what was the top one again the tension oh yeah and then obviously the actual percent the perception of the tension allowing your sort of mind to realize as well i think that's kind of what it's suggesting there isn't yeah. it it's yeah the stimulus triggers the release of growth factors i wonder if that's i wonder if those are like growth factors um resulting from your brain so sort of being like 
we need to create stronger connections to this muscle because it's being used at a you know a higher threshold than we we previously had you know yeah we need like reinforcements almost yeah we need we need more we need more uh what's the word impulses almost we need mm. more like stronger impulses coming in to some degree or to like to recruit some of those muscles that weren't recruited before you know yeah, yeah, like, yeah. if we're only using 30 percent, it's like we need to to grow out the like i guess the oh, i'm just trying to think of the best word to describe you know how like they go out like dendrites or whatever it's called but, yeah, yeah 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 so yeah um so yeah training appears to heighten the man- manifestation of androgenin receptors within muscles rendering them more amenable to anabolic hormones such as testosterone and growth hormone through substantial stimulation, satellite cells are bestowed upon muscle cells, amplifying protein synthesis and bolstering the muscle's capacity for subsequent growth. This is important seeing as muscle cells can contain multiple nuclei. Since nuclei house the DNA, they are pivotal for facilitating growth. Yet myonuclei exhibit a confined myonuclei domain. As the muscle cell size amplifies, a greater count of nuclei becomes necessary to effectively oversee the area and provide the needed protein synthesis. Moreover, studies uh, indicate that myonuclei tend to persist post-training, implying the potential permanence of these alterations, which is interesting. Yeah. Uh, is, I, wonder if, I wonder if this is why it's muscle memory, you know? The whole yeah. talk about muscle memory. Um, like, you, you're going to you recover your gains you lost from not training quicker than you took the first time, right? I've always felt that, to be fair. I have. And I, I also think, I don't know why, but I've always thought that, like, if you slowly go into it, you acquire that kind of ability to get back into it quicker next time when you have like time off. Whereas if you like, because I remember there used to be people at school who would like go f- really fucking hard at the gym and then inevitably get injured. And then when they come <laughs> back, they're really slow to doing it again. Whereas I feel like people who are much slow and do it incrementally, and then let's say they inevitably get injured as well. But when they so come back, their progress the is much quicker. Yeah. Um, yeah, I wonder if that's got anything to do with the myonuclei. Uh, but yeah, it's interesting. Quite possibly. Um, all right, so this last bit, so the biphasic nature of muscle growth. So training provides a stimulus, but recovery is when the actual growth happens. At a certain point, we must stimulate anabolic processes, maximizing the release of growth-related hormones like testosterone, growth hormone, and IGF-1. During this window, um, adequate protein intake allows protein to break down into amino acids for muscular repair and growth. The extent of recovery um, required correlates with the level of muscle damage and neurological fatigue induced by training. um, Anabolism lies in contrast to catabolism, which is when the body is aroused and focused on exertion and the breakdown of tissue. And yeah, I think we, like we've touched on that so many, so many times in other books, but just the importance of recovery. Um, yeah. If you don't get your recovery, you're just not going to improve. Of course. Um, cool. So yeah. the the next chapter, the current state of training. I mean, we kind of roughly touched over this at the mm. beginning with our with our own opinions. <laughs> now we'll go straight yeah, to yeah, this yeah, guy yeah, thinks yeah. as well. So bodybuilding training. Modern bodybuilding focuses on single joint exercises, which involve keeping the body rigid while moving one or two joints against resistance. This type of training focuses all the effort onto one muscle, allowing the bodybuilder to take into the point of say, sorry to take it to the point of complete fatigue, while also allowing for the maximum buildup of metabolites within the muscle. This will be combined with a relatively lightweight, often around sixty to seventy percent of the athlete's one rep maximum, taken to a high number of total repetitions, ten to fifteen, often with continuous time under tension. Continuous time under tension means that the joint is never locked out, such that the muscles kept at the sum amount of pressure for the entire set of the exercises. Towards their last set, they would have fatigued the majority of their muscle fibers, forcing the larger motor units to take over. There will also be a large stimu- simultaneous buildup of metabolites, as the blood hasn't had a chance to escape from the muscle, resulting in a huge temporary swelling of the muscle, the pump, and subsequent <laughs> sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. The reason bodybuilders don't train a lot of compound exercises is because no single muscle group has been taken 100% to failure. Therefore, it leaves gains on the table. Yeah. Um, and I love, I like this like little list of intensity techniques. So bodybuilders use a selection of interesting methods called intensity techniques to help them go beyond their maximum capacity. These include drop sets, burns, flush sets, negative supersets, assisted reps, partial reps, cheats, pre-exhaust. Uh, and, and a classic bodybuilding training split involves targeting a single muscle group or two or three during each workout. 
This way you can increase your training volume per workout, meaning lots of stimulus, whilst also maximizing recovery time between workouts for a given muscle. A good bodybuilding split should aim to keep similar muscle groups as far apart as possible. The issue with bodybuilding training is that training muscles in isolation does not build into muscular coordination and strength. Thus, many people believe it to be the least functional form of training. Yeah. Um, so, but there are benefits of the bodybuilding. No, training, of course, is, of course. Yeah. So when you go to failure on any given exercise, you actually exhaust your smaller and intermediate most units, meaning that the body has no choice but to recruit the largest and strongest one to complete the set. This means that rep 10 of your 70% uh, one rep max is in some ways very similar to rep one of your 100% one rep max. This does build strength. Training for pump and volume will also increase your strength endurance by adding to the glycogen stores in the muscles, along with other adaptations such as an increase in capillaries fueling the muscles with blood. You improve your ability to exert strength over time. But yeah, I, I thought that was quite an interesting like sort of deep dive into the reasons why, you know, bodybuilding is is limited or like once again like positive effects like yeah, people yeah. wouldn't still do it if you obviously didn't get a good body doing it and it didn't work yeah. it's just as he's saying you're kind of limiting the scope of your progress to just purely muscle building in specific areas right yeah yeah and when that gets to a point where <laughs> you can't scratch your own back you know <laughs> there's probably a bit of a trade-off or diminishing yeah. returns um yeah, but it is interesting. Also, it's funny some of those like different types of sets or you know different techniques yeah. that they use because some of them I don't even know. Like yeah, set, I, I'm actually going to look into some ones. of them. I I know some of them you can kind of guess right, like with the partial reps where yeah, you know, yeah. like like it's getting somebody else to help you to sort of do it. Um, yeah, we we know some of them, but yeah, you're right. There are some there that I've never. What's burn? I, th <laughs> you, I, I think you mentioned. Know. You definitely mentioned it in the book. You definitely mentioned it. I yeah. need to get back to that part because uh, I'm intrigued. Yeah, let's burn. Um, let's burn. All right, so powerlifting training. So powerlifting ex um, excels for building maximum strength, epitomized by its focus on bench press, squat, and deadlift movements. These three compounds, li uh, compound lifts involve numerous muscles in unison, so they are considered compound lifts. These mirror real-world actions like squatting, pressing, and bending, three fundamental primal movements. To build strength, lift 80 to 90% of your one rep max for one to four reps. This approach stimulates heightened neural drive, maximizes through maximal muscle fiber engagement, and generates muscle damage and tension. While training at 100% one rep max is feasible, its efficacy is diminished and it may compromise explosiveness. This approach is demanding, causing significant nervous system fatigue and requiring ample recovery time, which heightens injury risks and hampers progress. Consequently, many trainers suggest sticking to 75 to 85 percent of one rep max for most sessions. The dynamic effort method. This approach offers an alternative route to strength enhancement. The goal here is to amplify the rate of force generation by prioritizing acceleration over heavy resistance. It's crucial to recognize that from the perspective of your nervous system, explosive speed and explosive strength are indistinguishable. In terms of motor unit recruitment, rapidly lifting 50 to 70% of your one rep maximum uh, is akin to lifting 80 to 90% at a standard pace. Heavy partials. Heavy partials are another technique for strength advancement involving lifting a weight surpassing your one rep max, but within a limited range of motion. A great example is the rack pull. So that's when you have a barbell that's at a lower level, probably just below your knees, but it's on a rack, um, but it's not touching the floor. And here the, well, yeah. here the barbell begins elevated to approximately knee height positioned on a cage pins. These exploit the strongest phase of the deadlift motion, allowing training with exceptional weights. And I think that's quite interesting. Like, you know, I, I like the idea that, you know, force is force just to the, to the, to the brain, whether that's like, mm. you know, acceleration or weight. You, and so you can manipulate those two variables to like still almost obtain the same result um, just in different ways. And I have heard about those kind of heavy partials before. I think there was a guy called um, Mike Mensa. He was like a bodybuilder during Arnold Schwarzenegger's time. And he was like, I don't get them. I don't get my clients to do, was it concentric phases? I basically get them to hold at the strongest point for as long, almost like an isometric and mm. then just do the negative. 
the eccentric. It's not the eccentric afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But they don't do the concentric. And I thought that was really interesting. And I do see people in the gym, especially with like um, rack pulls, where they basically just pull it out just out of the pins and just hold it there for a long time. And then when they need to, then they start doing the eccentric form because that's yeah. you're essentially hitting the highest point of the strength like curve. Yeah. Um, I was doing that with a pull ups for a little bit. Like I'd start yeah. at the top and try and hold it and then eccentric down. I think yeah. I might actually restart doing that with like heavy, heavy weight, like stuff that I would never be able to pull myself up doing, but just, you know, put yeah. like 30, 40 kg between your legs and just try and hold it and then slowly work yourself down, do a set of like five or something. Yeah, no, um, it is, it's, it's really good. But yeah. it, once again, it kind of does also highlight that there are flaws in this as well. So for instance, like they were saying, you know, you're only doing a limited range of the motion. And mm -hmm. like we were saying before, you know, those transition periods, they're really like those transition movements, they're really important. And if you're not doing the full range of motion, then there's an aspect yeah. of it that will be weaker, right? So, you know, all of these have their pros and cons. And I think going off what he was saying earlier on, you know, you can pick and choose, you know, to make a kind of full rounded system. Um, this last point here, so progressive overload. I mean, we've talked about this before, but progressive overload simply means increasing the challenge over time as your body adapts. Novice lifters typically experience a steady and dependable progression in strength, yet a plateau arrives when consistent strength gains taper off. Optimal strength and adaptations seem to favor a cyclical approach. So kind of what you were talking about with the meso cycles, uh, meso, macro and micro cycles. Just like learning any skill, a period of consolidation is needed to cement the gains before moving on. Yeah. yeah. Yes, we... One second, let me just make a little time um so this is where it gets quite interesting now so obviously we've covered the current state um mm -hmm. with bodybuilding powerlifting and now we're going to sort of get back into history looking at the uh so the next chapter is called the forgotten history of techniques of physical culture so this is looking at sort of some of the techniques from old time strongmen and what i find so interesting about this before we even get into it is just how sometimes knowledge gets lost yeah like sometimes i don't know stuff that is that works and it's popular and obviously people do it sometimes maybe gets lost in translation maybe where it's like the apprentice thinks he's better than the master <laughs> he goes yeah. off he goes off and creates his own you know training program but yeah, forgetting yeah. the fundamentals of why the training existed in the first place kind of thing yeah, yeah. um it's like chesterton's fence kind of thing yeah yeah exactly yeah. that so old time strongman the title Old Time Strongman typically refers to traveling strongmen during the early 1900s who would perform feats of incredible physicality for audiences. Early Olympic lifting competitions included freestyle rounds, so dumbbell pushes and one arm lifts. It wasn't until the 1920s that these began to be standardized. However, by the 1928, they were just free lifts, the military press, clean and jerk, and snatch. One handed movements were dropped altogether. These two-handed exercises allowed the athlete to lift as much weight as possible over their heads with any technique using uh, two separate weights. Thus, the focus moved away from perfect form instead to greater weight. It's, it's so, it's so yeah. well, just on that point, it's just interesting how, like, you know, it was kind of for audiences. And yet audiences, it's there's you can obviously see an increase in weight, but you can't, the audience can't see what the strongman would have to do to do like you know single weight arms or things like that like yeah. how much more difficult to a degree that is and so yeah. something ends up being valued more than the other even if it's not valuable overall for the individual well, i think you even touched on it earlier when we said it was like easier to measure and like yeah, once, yeah. It's, once it's quantified they just want to increase that no matter what yeah um, yeah forgetting the form is it there's like if you think about it there's only very few um sports left where it's not quantified so for example like I'm pretty sure maybe maybe I am just chatting out my ass here, but like stuff like um diving, they do it on like actual form. Do you get what I mean? Oh, yeah, yeah, for like yeah. technique. They're look and like gymnastics as well. They're like it's not all about the quantification of how much how much weight you can lift, how quick yeah, can you do yeah. something. It's very much like how beautiful does it look? Like are yeah. you coordinated and stuff like that? And I think it's quite interesting how maybe that's another thing where it's just evolved over time. Yeah. And once again, when it's quantifiable, it's then it becomes hot. What's the word? Like easier to decide, and you don't have to like explain why you made the decision for what's the most beautiful form. Do you kind of yeah, get what I mean? Like, yeah, oh, yeah. You just lift the heaviest is easy. The judge, the, you don't need a judge panel. It's like, oh, yeah. you just lifted the most. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I get you. I get you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, so sorry. So the obliques sit on either side of our torso and assist in rotation and lateral bending. There is little involvement of these muscles in conventional powerlifting, other than help to, uh, other than to help stabilize the trunk. 
whereas they help considerably with one-hand movements. It's no surprise then that the record for the lift is still held by Arthur Saxon, who lifted a 336-pound barbell and a 112-pound kettlebell simultaneously in the early 1900s. <laughs> what the How much is that in kilos? Uh, what is that 36. in kilos? Put it, throw it in. And 112 pound. 152 fucking kilos. That's, like, he's, he's saying you lifted a barbell and then a oh, kettlebell at the same time. So he's done. He's doing this, isn't he? Like one heavier than the other. Oh, Am I wrong to oh, think that? that? Oh, yeah, gosh. I think so. For me, simultaneously means he's doing it at the same time. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Um, so he's basically got 300. Uh, how much kg was it? So 150 kilos 150 in one. 150 kilos then... in one hand, and he's got like another, like uh, I don't know, like 90 or something in the other hand. Yeah, like, yeah. maybe a bit less. No, 112 should be less. 50, like. 50 kilos 50. in the other. Yeah. But he must be so out of balance. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, the think about it, he must. His core must just yeah. be like, oh gosh, yeah, so yeah. so strong. Yeah. The fact is that these exercises that involve lifting something that's perfectly flat and straight with two hands is very rare. Once again, we, we spoke about this earlier, like mm -hmm. the lifting in terms of like how often do you find yourself with the perfect barbell to push above your head? You know, it's very much like you've got like some weird contraption. You're trying to push up with one arm or pull yeah. up with one arm. Um, so offset exercises. These are exercises that involve one handed movements or movement with different weights loaded on each side. Such movements require that you engage the obliques on the opposite side of the body to prevent it from bending under the load. And then you've got anti-lateral flexion. These are movements that involve resisting gravity's attempts to bend you sideways in the lumbar spine. Um, and this is kind of what I was saying at the beginning to you, where I've taken a bunch of these sort of one-hand twist movements into my, they were mm -hmm. in my workout program, obviously I'm not going at the moment, but like, like you know, twisting across my body, like putting it down across, like, whereas before it was very much, you know, you, gra you grab like um what you call it just like a bar and you just you know you're just pulling down straight like you're not doing yeah. anything involving your body like twisting and stuff it's mental to think how much if you follow the sort of like the current ways of doing all this sort of exercise how little twisting you do and i wonder if that's the reason why we have like bad back issues as well because we're never training the core like we're never training that yeah. twisting movement we're never training that like yeah oblique balancing act yeah um, and I, I there's there's this kind of notion in bodybuilding and like powerlifting that you don't need to train your core because your core is being trained by these like you know compound yeah, but, movements but, but as we I, now know it's not it's like yeah. the only thing he's training to do as he just said is stabilize you in one like one plane yeah, yeah it's not exactly. helping you twist from either side or like balance you know yeah, yeah. like yeah. it's almost like it makes sense now to like literally have one side of your body with a really heavy weight and one side with a slightly lighter weight yeah, yeah, and yeah. just try and keep your body straight that's yeah. literally like that's training it more you know yeah. And how often do you ever have like different weights in each hand? You don't. Yeah. You never have a different weights in each hand, right? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's funny. Yes. Um, so, what? grip strength. So, showmen would use thicker bars on their barbells and dumbbells. I remember I used to have those kind of like fat grips yeah. that you could put on. Yeah, yeah, yeah I remember barbells. that. I think I just left them at the gym once and they went. Yeah. Um, the ulna digits, so the two smaller ones, contribute 34 to 67% of total grip strength. Wow. This is because the hand is designed to work as a single, function, um, single functional unit. For example, merely placing the knuckle of the pinky finger on top of the bar during a pull-up rather than hanging from the fingers increases lat activation, which I find Ooh. really interesting. That's interesting. I'm never going to, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Interestingly, if your brain senses that you don't have a tight grip on something, it won't let you exert a maximal force. Mm -hmm. And it is this is something that I think I think it's the number one metric for cognitive decline as well, grip strength. Is it? It's really no weird. Way. I don't know. It like weirdly like it correlates to um much better cognitive health. But I think it it's so important and I think it's such a good thing to train that you never really train, but maybe just as a byproduct of doing other exercises but there's a guy who so who runs the gym that i go to where i do calisthenics and strongman stuff and apparently he's not like a big guy like he looks like he's he used to be in the army and now he set up this gym and i don't think he's like a particularly big guy he looks in good shape but that's about it but apparently he's got like loads of world records for grip strength and no he was doing this thing the other day where he was like picking up 50 kilos with his like little finger and it was just like obscene like that is obscene. you know I think I'd, I think yeah. he'd rip my finger off if I did. Oh, that. man, he probably could, yeah. <laughs> oh, um, my God. But, yeah, it's just all these things that we just, like, overlook, right? Like, grip strength, we never but think about I've, it. I've, I don't know about you, but I've always noticed when I do stuff like deadlifting and even pull-ups to some degree, I almost yeah. feel like actually the first thing for me that, like, stops working so is my grip. And your grip yeah, yeah, it's my form and my grip. It's, yeah. like, I feel like it's my, uh, like, 
limiting factor so to speak and obviously mm. we never really train it directly apart from doing those yeah. exercises and therefore if you're only doing those exercises once a week how are you ever going to increase your forearm and grip strength right like yes yeah. exactly exactly yeah. so yes do you want me to continue with the next part yeah so we got the mind muscle connection so old time strong men achieved a mind muscle connection by one con consciously controlling the muscle and two by using overcoming isometrics it, this is what you were saying earlier on yeah much. so Consciously controlling the muscle is by simply practicing activating muscles at will uh, so you can improve mind-muscle connection. With training and apt cues, precise control over diverse muscles is achievable, contingent on their usage frequency. So this is you know, a bit like the ears we were talking about earlier and stuff. So then you've got the isometric contraction. So this is a contraction of the muscle that doesn't result in movement. If you were to lift a weight and then hold it at arm's length, you'd be maintaining isometric contractions in several muscle groups. Overcoming isometrics involve exerting force against an immovable object, thus enhancing strength by increasing neural drive, the capacity to activate muscle fibers in a given muscle. Employing this method will allow you to tap into the full extent of your latent strength and power. So I remember, because obviously from reading this book, I actually took inspiration. I started yeah. um, before <clears throat> doing benches. I'd stand next to the wall and just try and just bench push press the wall. Yeah, <laughs> just. I literally was just imagining people other just people in the gym. gym just like, you, yeah. what is this guy doing? I'm trying to turn into the Hulk. I'm like, oh, like... <laughs> got like veins coming down my head you know full on red That's um funny. but it, it's also another thing it kind of <clears> removes <throat> any excuse right especially for push movements yeah for not going to the gym everybody's got a fucking wall they can't push through yeah so just yeah. go there and just it's try good. and push you all over you know yeah. it's like yeah, yeah um but he from what i remember from his uh like designing his uh programs he kind of uses them more as warm-ups rather than as actual training like he used yeah. it to warm up your muscles before you go into your like sets yeah um but yeah so an overcoming isometric mimics attempting to lift 110 percent of your one rep max it demands full strength engagement however because they are without a strength curve you can sustain this peak effort for an extended duration they often involve holding this max power for six to ten seconds for each rep then you have ballistic isometrics so this technique infuses explosivity into isometric actions by imbuing them with explosive intent imagine trying to press the wall forcefully and suddenly as though exploding into it this can entail sustained maximum contraction or successive explosive efforts. I mean, realistically, if you think about uh, clap push-ups and push-ups mm. where you go off the ground, that's literally what you're doing. Exactly. Because you can't move the floor. You're just explosively pushing up off it. Yeah. Um, then you've got quasi-isometric. So this technique entails an ultra-slow movement throughout and then exercises full range of motion. Commonly applied to body weight uh, movements like pull-ups or push-ups and single repetition can span 30 to 60 seconds. This cultivates a strong mind-muscle connection and emphasizes precise technique. And to be honest, this is something I was thinking about doing if I obviously, I now can go to the gym, but if I was like, right, I'm stuck in my house all day, I was like, how can you make push-ups harder? Well, you could try and make each rep last 30 fucking yeah. seconds. That would be yeah. pretty goddamn hard. Um, and in the very last ones, you've got passive quasi-isometrics. These can develop even greater control as they involve deliberately relaxing most of the body and focusing force only on necessary muscles for the movement. In contrast, active quasi-isometrics involve engaging the entire body for maximal tension. Um, in my head, that's something like a plank, I guess. Yeah, I plank, you feel like you're doing everything, holds. right? Like, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, precisely. But yeah, these are like, it's so interesting. Like, these are stuff, once again, like we said before, when you're sort of like thinking about training, uh with the the normal body uh, bodybuilding world it's never really talked about apart from concern concentric exercises or just sorry a full range of motion exercises just like push up push down push up push down it's never like or you can hold it you can you know, like you know, slow down the time you're in it yeah, yeah. you can yeah. then you can then do stuff where you focus on like not like tensing anything else and just tensing yeah. the muscle you can yeah. alternatively tense everything like it's just there's just so much like variety if anything the only thing i remember from reading books like this is i just get inspired i'm like wow i've there's so much i haven't tried exactly do you know what i mean there's so yeah, much yeah, yeah. i can add to my workouts now yeah. we are like so take, limited yeah in like thinking in this kind of just bodybuilder way of of working out but actually there's this there's so much there because you can just take like take any exercise well not maybe not every but most of the exercises you're currently doing and then apply one of these like new ways of doing it either yeah. the eccentric the isometrics the quasi isometrics all of it like any of it and you've now created a new way let's say you've hit a plateau as well like you you just haven't improved on the weight in ages yeah you've created a new way to train this muscle for a few weeks that can and i think i think we get into it later talks about is it here or maybe we've already gone past it i think we went past it yeah here we go just like learning this it talks about like plateaus right it's just like learning any skill a period of consolidation is needed to cement yeah. the gains before moving on 
Yeah. And I think that's the perfect way of thinking about it as well. Like you can train up to a certain extent, change the way you're training, maybe it's eccentrics, isometrics, quasi isometrics, whatever. You've now got all the tools in the toolkit and then go back after it after like a like a month of training that. Yeah. Um, and that's just it. It's like, you know, if you ex if you use these tools more and more, you start to have you create this arsenal of just anything is at your disposal. And you, and that's why, like, I think educating yourself on this is just so important because it just allows you so much more freedom. Be like, okay, I've hit this like plateau here. How do I find a different way? How do I problem solve this? You know, solve the problem of getting rounded and figuring out a different way of hitting it. And you have all these tools at your disposal. So, yeah, I think it's I think it's so important. Um, so next chapter kettlebells a secret weapon for functional power and this really is the like functional tool i think the distinct kettlebell design uh, design places the weight away from the handle's center offering control over the center of mass for leverage and swinging swinging introduces momentum torque and dynamic angles of resistance start with a kettlebell around 15 percent of body weight for safety progress um, progressing to about 30 percent for experienced users Unlike linear dumbbells and barbells, kettlebells encourage con continuous core engagement through varied positions. The kettlebell swing. The kettlebell swing uh, swing's explosive nature engages fast twitch fibers, particularly in the glutes, the body's powerhouse muscles designed for propulsion. This often translates to enhanced deadlifts, squats, sprints, and vertical jumps. The swing's continuous cyclical motion um, suits extended rep ranges, fostering strength, endurance, and work capacity. Loaded carries. Another pre um, prevalent technique with kettlebells involves gripping one in each hand and walking, referred to as the loaded carry. This exercise mimics functional daily tasks and enhances walking under load. It fortifies hips, core, and balance. This exercise can be made more challenging by not just adding more weight, but also greater distance, time, or speed. Introducing unilateral loading also adds to the difficulty. Like once again, like we're taking this kind of simple exercise where you're just carrying two kettlebells and there are so many different like parameters to it. There are so many different ways that you can tweak it to, you know, like, like they just said, time, distance, you know, your gait, anything like that. So it's like once you kind of start to see all exercises like that and how you can tweak I mean, little bits here and there. It was even, we just said the unilateral. So was it unilateral? Sorry. Yeah. The, the idea of yeah. even training with different weights on each side. Yeah. People be like, oh my god, you're training to like I don't know, you're going to create an imbalance. But yeah. actually, part of the reason is that you're not actually training the muscle that you're thinking. You're actually trying to train your core to yeah. like balance whilst you're doing it. Like, does yeah. it make sense? How often do you ever get like the perfectly loaded thing where it's balanced each side? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's oh, amazing. Like this, this side is equally as heavy so as this side. Yeah. How do you like, pack how... your shopping? Do you think it's yeah. like look there one minute? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and also, like when you carry the shop bags, you're right? Do you like weigh them out to make sure they're both the same yeah, weight? Exactly. Oh, like, yeah. It's so funny when you think about it because it just it just seems so obvious, right? And then once again, it does. Like, yeah. We we didn't know about this before, right? It's one of those things we just didn't even think about. Or we did, we knew it. We we do know it. It's just somebody's articulated it, and we're yeah. like, ah, yes, of course. It's almost like that paradigm has kind of been shattered and now you can see all these mm -hmm. other like options at your disposal. Yeah. Um, heavy clubs. So similar to kettlebells, heavy clubs are versatile tools. The gamma cast akin to the kettlebell ha halos involves driving the club around your head while maintaining a straight torso. This targets shoulder stability and enhances mobility. Other club movements include windmills, barbarian squats, um, push press and hammer exercises. Unique to the club bells and somewhat to kettlebells, they create traction, force, and joints differing from compressive force seen in most gym exercises. This promotes range of motion and safeguards against joint issues in the long run. I mean, once again, like I've never even used a, a club before. I've seen them at like my gym, but I've just I've never used them. I've never even like. Yeah. But it makes sense how they they obviously incorporate a bunch of these different things. So obviously, you're swinging it around your head, right? So you're like yeah. you're getting that full mobility in, and it's obviously yeah. making you use your core and stuff yeah um so yeah i don't know if it's worth just going through all the different exercises or if we should just continue on because yeah if, if maybe people want, if people want to understand like all the different types of kettlebell exercises you should definitely check out the book summary and also the book itself because it sort of details all the different types but obviously yeah. if we reel them off in my head here it's just like people can understand it but maybe it's just better if they sort of read it or see yeah it no i get it. i agree yeah um so should we just move on to the to the next one yes okay. yeah so unusual tools for unusual strength 
One second. So training functionality allows you to use a greater array of tools to develop stabilizing muscles and dynamic strength in ways that supplement athletic training or regular lifestyle. I'm gonna just gonna use the main names rather than yeah, yeah going yeah. into the details. So some of these include tires, so tire flipping. I'm sure people have seen people doing that. Uh, sledgehammers, so like smacking a tire with a sledgehammer. Uh, sandbags. Well, I think we talked about this earlier because the mm -hmm. the gravity shifts as you lift them up. The center of masses. Um, yeah. yeah, that's it. Sorry, not the gravity. Yeah, the gravity stays the same, I think, <laughs> but the center of mass changes. Um, then you've got medicine balls. Uh, you know, these are coming more and more popular these days. Yeah. Um, then you've got stability balls and balance boards. And actually, balance boards, I've seen so many people recently just talking about how great they are. I yeah. think for me, one of my recovery for my ACL, I'm going to be on a balance board like no tomorrow because I think that's yeah. going to be super important so. for it. Um, then you've got resistance bands um, and atlas stones. So mm. any item become an effective functional tool when used in the right way. I mean, if you really think about it, we have so many things that you could technically use as a tool, like even a bloody yeah. book, you grab a yeah. book and you start doing like stuff like this, you're still training the same motions just with like a, like a lighter weight, right? So um, anything that provides resistance to some degree, I mean, fuck it, you could get like a, I'm just trying to think if there's any, there must be some household items that could be used. Oh, right. Like you could use a pan. I mean, like anything, the whole idea here is that like, it doesn't, it, you know, the center of mass, it doesn't matter where it is. It doesn't matter if it's like being designed to be used in fitness. I think you could probably use pretty much anything and it will be working your body in some way. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yes. And then we've gone into, so we go into now, sorry, proprioception training. So proprioception refers to your body's ability to sense where it is in space. It achieves this by receiving feedback from the muscles regarding stretch and contraction. So muscle spindles, these are stretch receptors that can detect when muscles change length by knowing the length of each muscle in the body and the brain can create a mental image of the body. Then you've got the Golgi tendon organs. These are found in the tendons and tell us about alterations in muscle tension. It's thanks to our Golgi tendon organs that we aren't constantly ripping handles off the doors. They allow for precise movements during balancing exercises. Uh, I'm not sure that's a problem. <laughs> Pansinian corp corpuscles. These are located in the skin and detect pressure changes. These tell us about texture and temperature, but can also help us know how much weight is placed on one foot versus the other, for example. So the propios proprioceptors work in tandem with information from the other senses in order to help us balance and move. For example, when your eyes and vestibular system detect a 30 degree, 30 degree tilt in the world, your neck and core muscles provide vital information to interpret this as leaning to one side. This prevents the body from perceiving a fall and triggering corrective actions. I don't know if it was in this book, but did maybe it was in this book where he talks about being hung upside down and after 30 minutes, your body flips itself. Oh, wow. I don't, I don't remember that being in this. Oh, maybe it wasn't. And I don't know if it's bullshit or not. But I remember surely the blood would just go to your head for so, so somebody long. Somebody said something along the lines of like being suspended in like a weird orientation. Your body actually flicks around after a certain period of time. But I can't help but think that's bullshit. I just I can't help but think that's like absolute trust. But anyway, we can that's it, yeah. we can Don't cross know. over that fake news. Fake fake <laughs> news. Um, so the next bit is neck training. Um, and I yes. found I, this is just like, you know, grip training or things like that. It's it's just very like niche, but you can see how it might have like a role. Um, so neck training carries remarkable significance, enhancing both central nervous system signaling and spatial awareness. The neck rich in muscle spindles plays a pivotal role in appropriate reception. Maintaining a steady head fosters balance and overall performance. The neck and head possess self-stabilizing mechanisms I think which we talked about in exercise, right? So that we can run and we don't have this like like the pig that doesn't have that tendon yes, that yeah, holds yeah. its head up. Yeah. So it like runs like this, right? Yeah. Um, whereas we do. Um, so it possesses self-stabilizing -st mechanisms crucial for steady vision aided by small eye muscles. They are vital in counteracting forces during the action like jumping and running. An intriguing phenomenon in it is eye-head coupling where in the neck complements vision for object tracking and environmental awareness. Where the head goes, the body follows. Head harness targets neck muscles, training their flexion, lateral flexion, extension, protrusion, retraction, and rotation. And I actually got one of these recently. I got one of these neck, yeah. neck brace things. I wanted to yeah. try it out. I was like, okay, why? Because I think it's also fucking cool when like people have a kind of bit of a muscular neck, you know, especially like, when they're like angry or like in films and stuff and you can like, see those kind of things. Just, yeah. yeah, I just like, I just like seeing quite cool. Like, yeah. yeah, yeah. Aerodynamic. Exactly. Um, 
I'll be like one of those fucking lizards that just. <laughs> 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 um, and so I'm again, sure it's Park, isn't it? A dinosaur. Bro. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 um, and then the last bit here, the serape effect. So the serape effect involves rotational moves that stretch torso muscles for maximal power. It stems from diagonal muscle alignments, which are the rhomboids, serratus anterior, and obliques, forming an X shape resembling the Mexican serape that gives Ooh. the effect its name. Um, I think it was a Mexican wrestler, was he? Contralateral movement is ubiquitous in activities like walking, where the supporting footsteps um, foot steps back while the op opposite shoulder swings forward. In martial arts, punches exemplify this pr um, principle, rotating the dominant shoulder back and the opposing hip forward, um, readies the fighter for the subsequent punch. This linkage of movement is termed kinetic linking. And I think, yeah, that's that's like quite an important one. It's like how you build that momentum. You see it a lot in like tennis players as well, the kind of coil, how they like coil their whole body up like a spring yeah. and they uh, unleash unleash that like full power yes yeah, serape i don't know if he's a <laughs> i love it how you the reference was he actually a Me mexican wrestler i think he was saying? wasn't he yeah. yeah i can't i can't remember that reference i just thought it's uh, maybe it's not me. is it just check just check i was like oh I I know know it might be a blanket <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know where I got that. Very from. different, very different, but it's okay. We'll I was, go with it. <laughs> Rapi, the famous Mexican wrestler. <laughs> I thought it was like that guy who wore yeah, like a yeah, mask yeah. in WWE and he like could do Yeah, Rey Mysterio, like... do you mean? Yeah. Good stuff. The old Rey Mysterio effect. Yeah. Good stuff. Um, <laughs> so we're on to, <laughs> on to the next chapter. We have a laugh. Right, so <laughs> mastering your body. This is right up your street. So calisthenics, often termed bodyweight training, encompasses exercises employing your body weight for resistance. The nervous system doesn't differentiate between external weights and your own limbs resistance. Uh, this basically means it all remains resistance. As body weight is utilized, strength gains enhance relative strength. The issue, of course, is that these moves can only ever provide a limited amount of resistance. The solutions to this are perform extremely high rep ranges, switch to unilateral one-sided movements, which is quite an interesting way of doing it, mm. and extend the lever arm or train explosively. So straining, uh, training stability and anti-extension movements. Rigidity is essential in the body's ki kinematic chains, rigid bodies and mobile joints for force translation. Core stability training involves not just maintaining, rig uh, sorry, maintaining rigidity, but is also achieving it when required. So the best anti-extension move used commonly by gymnasts is the hollow body, this movement teaches you to create a rigid core that will make any other advanced calisthenics movements possible. Another example is the Lalan push-up, which involves a push-up position with arms extended forward, uh, forward using only fingers for support. Full range push-ups test shoulder, finger, and core strength. Similarly, ab rollouts, particularly from a standing position, engage anti-extension and anti-flexion movements. Inverting your position challenges leg body perception and orientation. I need to check out the holy body, actually. Whole, uh, yeah, we do it quite a lot in class. It's basically yeah. just like you just sit on your back what, and then kind of like it's almost like you're going for a crunch and ah. then you stop and you just you hold stop your, and your leg and your legs extended and your body's okay. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And you just try and, and hold you, that. How, you just hold it as long as you can. Is that, is that uh, well, I mean, we do it for about a bunch of sets of like 30 seconds or something, but it is just. It, it, a warm up is it like a warm up? To it's kind of a warm up because it's an isometric hold, so it kind of just okay. gets your like muscles like going, and also it does translate over to like a lot of other calisthenic exercises. So, for instance, if you're trying to do a, f um, a front lever, right, you need your whole body straight, and so you have to contract your whole body to hold yourself in that position. S a similar kind of goes with like the back lever, although not as much. Or there's this new exercise that we've been doing where you hold on to like, I don't know, some kind of stationary appliance or like a really heavy weight. And you do that kind of like flag thing or like dragon flag where you lower your body down, but you hold yeah, your yeah. body hollow the whole time. It's like you're really rigid, but you're just slowly lowering yourself yeah, down. Yeah. That absolutely kills your core, but it's so good for you. Um, yeah. So that's another good one. Um, so the next bit, so the freestanding handstand. 
The handstand is a prime exercise for authentic proprioception development. Inverting your position challenges orientation and leg body perception. For a heightened proprioception impact, practice hand balancing with eyes closed. This will force you to rely solely on your vestibular system and proprioception for balance. I mean, the handstand is just like the key for improving proprioception. And it is funny how you start to develop it because it just takes, it's just a lot of practice. Like I found now recently, I can start to get a handstand and hold it, but it's just taken so long because your body just is like, what the fuck am I doing? Like, um, this is really weird. Mm. Um, so plyometric training for explosive performance. Plyometrics are explosive movements utilizing the stretch shortening cycle to engage fast twitch muscle fibers. This cycle involves storing elastic energy during muscle le lengthening. And I think we talked about this in Ross Sedgley's book, is like the box jump kind of thing. Yeah. In calisthenics, plyometrics typically involve launching yourself into the air in some way. Popular examples include clapping push-ups, um, clapping pull-ups, or squat jumps. Rate of loading um, rate of loading is while the Serape effect focuses on force generation via stretching, rate of loading pertains to the speed of this lengthening and shortening process. Faster transitions between these stages, uh, stages channel more power into the final movement. For example, in a squat jump, you rapidly rise um, from the bottom position. In a counter movement jump, you swing arms, stretch, squat, and thrust upwards, extending the muscle's active state for potential cross bridging, which is the attachment of actin and myosin, enabling filament shortening. This leads to heightened traction, resulting in significantly higher vertical leap than a standard squat jump. In short, this is not about storing elastic energy at all. To delve deeper into this concept, you can incorporate shock training. Here you perform a counter movement while absorbing impact as seen in depth jumps. That's the thing that he was talking about in the book. Um, this approach taps into the myotatic uh, reflex, which instinctively contracts stretched um, muscles. The myotatic reflex is monosynaptic requiring uh, just two connections. I think that's the myotatic reflex. That's the knee thing, isn't it? When like you hit the knee and the knee kind of almost uh, jerks. Just, like, immediately goes awesome. up, yeah. Yeah. Could be. I could be wrong. Uh, this training fosters enduring explosive power gains by conditioning the central nervous system to anticipate abrupt forceful contractions upon entering stretch positions. And I think that's quite interesting, isn't it? Like that and the thing that you talked about earlier on with the, um, the rigidity, like yeah. training yourself when to be rigid and when not to be rigid, you know, and how like, you know, this stuff is probably used so much in martial arts. Um, oh, yeah. as you could imagine when you're like, when you need to yeah. be fluid and when you need to be like rock solid kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, yes. Okay, so on to the next part. So relearning to move. So with greater mastery over your body, you gain greater mastery over your environment. You can move more freely through it and manipulate it more easily too. The stronger and fitter you are, the more options you have when it comes to your, to your movement. The fewer obstacles you will face. Strength is movement and movement is freedom. We have designed our environment around us to the point where we barely even need to stoop at any point during the day, let alone run, climb, crawl or swing. And I think I really liked that point. Like, it's just interesting to think we we our approach to fitness now is so much like, oh, I need to look good or, you know, I'm 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 going uh, whenever I do fitness, it's like an hour at the gym. And that's the only mm. time I do it. The rest, of it, and then that compensates for the rest of my day, and I don't have to think about it at all. Rather than like thinking about it as, oh wow, this unlocks so many opportunities. The fitter I am, I can do this. I can do that. You know, um, mm. and almost like fitness is a, con a constant thing that is always happening. And the more like, and it's something you lose with, over time as well. Like you think about it with age, yeah, it's something yeah. that you can always be developing or, yeah. or trying to maintain as best as possible. Right? Absolutely. I think when you use the example of age, it is very clear that like, okay, wow, this option is not available to me anymore. I can't just you use know, it, use it or lose tennis. it. I can't phrase, just, yeah, exactly. And I think one of the main things is like, you see when people get like tennis elbow, mm. right? It's one of the most like common injuries. And that just suddenly it's like, oh, wow, I'll probably never play squash again. Or I'll never do this. Or like, you know, I have to have physiotherapy. I mean, in your case, for example, like, you know, <laughs> you you can't you can't play football at the moment. But my point yeah. being is in, you know, you want to be that person who has all the all the most options available to them. You know, yeah. because why not? Um and then that also brings in that aspect of like the mindset and the intellectual stimulation 
of problem solving, right? Oh, okay, I've got all these options at my disposal and now I can, you know, it's it's challenging me. I'm like cognitively aware of what of my environment. I'm engaging in it. Mm. Um, yeah, quite interesting. Um, so training movement. The basic idea behind Ido Portal's philosophy is for the movement to be viewed as the primary goal, not a means to an end. So process, not product. Instead of working on muscles, Ido works on movement and skills. And this is like, I remember coming across Ido Portal. He's like this movement coach and yep. he's really impressive. And it's, it's, it kind of changed the way that people look at a lot of sport and a lot of fitness because it very much taps into what um, Adam Sinicki talked about in that ATSP, like kind of hierarchy. They're like focusing on the fundamentals, which in this case are movement, just as like Ross Edgley talks about the general f- uh, physical preparedness. But mm-hmm. he's saying that everything that like most kind of fitnesses that we get into what underpins them is just our ability to move. And if we train movement, yeah. then we can naturally extrapolate that onto any kind of other kind of sports. It's, it's kind of a bit like what you said, I've all beginning of this book where it was like breaking it down from like individual proficiencies to skills mm-hmm. and stuff. But like yeah, the yeah. thing that underlines it all technically, like you're just saying, is like the movement. Like because if you can't move in a certain direction or a certain way, like how can you even do the skill? <laughs> like the skills exactly. usually require some level of movement, right? Like apart yeah. from maybe like reading the game, which is all like depending on the sport, right? It's movement's almost like the first priority and therefore if you can have the biggest range of movement and the biggest range with strength within that movement yeah. as well you know it's... and it seems it seems funny to train movement you would just almost naturally assume mm. oh yeah i can move but actually we're not that you know um we're not that flexible you know we don't do half of these movements so why would we naturally be able to do them our body is like being conditioned to sit down in a particular way and move and walk in a particular way and like we, he just said you know we barely have the chances every day to run, crawl, or swim, or whatever, or climb. Um, and I remember watching a interview, or not an interview, but like I remember watching that um, Conor McGregor went and got taught by Ido Portal because he okay. wanted to like kind of break it down back to the go back to the basics and really like then build his way up from there. Um, and I think he's like quite a sought after, you know, pioneer in that whole. Didn't you area. buy a course from him as well ages ago? Am I right to think you I, did, or maybe? I mean, I re re see if you have that still. I'd be intrigued to like have a look at it. Yeah, I can't remember if I I can't remember if I had a course in it, but I definitely was like really into him watching a couple of his videos. I mean, I'm sure through the videos he probably has enough like sort of uh, resources to get started with some of this movement training for sure. Yeah, I think it was something you can do by yourself, right? Like it's one of those things you don't need. You don't need a gym, right? It's one of these. So many people use excuses, I guess. Of I can't find a gym, or my gym doesn't have the equipment. But it's like this is literally just training movements. Yeah, so, exactly, exactly. I, if funnily enough, I remember when I first came across him, like my mate Liam introduced me to him, and it was the first time I'd come across this concept of just like finding. You know how we talk about like break things down to their uh, break things down into their fundamentals, focus on yeah. that, and then start to build into like the skills. It was the first time I ever came across that concept. It just happened to be in like a fitness area where you know movement was the fundamental and then you can build on anything else and it was just like a weird thing like obviously it sounds pretty commonsensical that whatever you approach deconstruct it into its components and find the fundamental thing but for some reason i just remember that hitting me like a fucking train i was like oh it's my god one of those, like so much sense like paradigm shifts right yeah like absolutely you like you re-see it through like a different lens is, yeah. yeah 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 it was it was good um so one of these things so animal flows One way to achieve this is through animal flows, which place particular emphasis on animal movements or traveling forms. The three staples are ape, beast, and crab, and the transitions between these positions. Some of the organizations that offer this type of training are GMB, Movement 20X, Movnat, and these methods introduce unconventional positions in resistance training. Conventional training often involves repetitive movements in a, sing- in a single plane, while even advanced approaches like kettlebell flows maintain predictable sequences. Movement training emphasizes improvisation, creativity, and adaptability, promoting strength and mobility in unanticipating angles and patterns. Athletes fluidly uh, transition between movements, expressing themselves through intu- intuitive and inventive exploration. And I think that's just... I think that's so key. That's one of the main things that I actually took away from this book is 
you never hear about, and we've talked about this prior to this um, podcast, but this idea of training unpredictable movements. Mm. Because why would you, the whole, it almost is, goes against the very concept. You, you're actively training something, but you can't actively train an unpredictable movement. You just have to kind of move. You right? just have to dance. Exa- dance. Well, dancing is a prime yeah. one, right? Like, yeah. And you can understand why so many people are terrible at dancing or don't have, I remember Ross Edgerly in his book, um or it's a good point about the like concept. People are terrible dancing like, it makes they, sense. they are because yeah, we're, yeah, yeah. we're conditioned to move in a particular way and I, we don't follow our what ross edgley called phys, uh, physiological intuition and i mm. love that concept i think that is so important because if you can just follow your movements your intuition on how how you should move i think if you train that ability then you can pick things up really fucking quickly and you're yeah. like oh that makes sense i know how to you know um i know what's coming next almost and i think it's almost like we've been built up to be like semi-robotic in our in the ways we move right like yeah, you were saying 100%. before where you know if you go to the gym and we're kind of like talking like single plane movements like push pull <laughs> You're kind of like maybe if you use cables, you've got some sort of variety in the sort yeah. of angles you're pulling at, right? But you're still not pulling at some really weird angle back down here, right? Which yeah. could possibly happen in life. But at least if you train that way, you're gonna, you know, be prepared for maybe some movement that might appear in a sport, right? Yeah. Whereas if you've never prepared for it, you've got a high propensity, I guess, in my head, or at least logically makes sense that you might be more likely to be injured if you put yourself through like a weird angle of position that you've basically untrained yourself for because yeah the only way you move is in a certain direction right like i get sometimes why for example maybe a sprinter wants to literally condition himself just to move forward yeah, right? yeah. but there's but there is you know they're still losing loads of potential no of course the side etc right so, yeah yeah a yeah. hundred percent and i think it really does just add something to what whatever you're training because there's there's almost a, cogn- a cognitive conflict as well there where like why would your body want to move out of its normal comfortable position, right? Like we love being in comfort and our body doesn't like to stress itself that much. And so if you're presented with a situation where you need to move like this and it's not a way that you normally do it, there's probably a cognitive conflict there as well. You're like, actually, I don't want to, you know, it's, it's harder to get into that. And I remember like, um, I remember watching, I think it was the 2012 Olympics and there was this swimmer and I think she had done incredibly well. I think she'd won a bunch of golds and they were looking at her regime and I think she had like adopted doing ballet and other things that like would allow and kind of lend certain movements and certain like skills that she acquires yeah. in these other sports that you would never think are related um, to her sport that she can translate over, uh, transfer over. Yeah, I think I think, um, I think we use the like the the comparison on the last podcast or if we didn't it's because i was chatting about it with somebody recently Mm. but it's it's kind of like the same with knowledge in terms of like you know you take the best ideas i think it was last podcast right where you take the best ideas from different disciplines and you can combine them in new ways like it might help you understand your own discipline better because you've got this like repository of ideas this is obviously more repository of physical movements so like you've trained yourself and have strength in different directions that people in your sport literally haven't trained themselves in. Yeah. And then when you like sprint off an explosive direction in another like in another way and they can't do the same thing, it's because they haven't trained that type like type of movement, yeah. right? It, it can almost be as simple as that, you know. A hundred percent. And obviously, like he talks a lot in this book about you know sports specific training. And like obviously, to be professional at some sports, you probably do need some sports specific training around like you know training the muscles and the movements that you're going to use in the sport. But what what his point here is people are missing out on potential other avenues where they could train certain aspects of their movements, which still would add additional, like, I guess you could call ammunition to your sport, but yeah, yeah, yeah. you're yeah. going to have something that other people don't have. Yeah. Um, and for me, it just, it just made like, if you just think about it, it does make sense. If you have that extra bit of like extra specialness, you know, you can end up being a standout performer in your sport because you've got something these other people don't have because everybody's training Absolutely. the same. Absolutely. And it just, like you said, it unlocks, opportunities and experiences that you wouldn't normally be able to do like if you know if you have this kind of ability to move in particular ways then you can go when you're invited to go dancing somewhere you can do it right like it's Mm. it's just an option that has been unlocked and you're not you're not doing it to unlock that option but it just means that whatever the world brings to you there are now more experiences at your disposal um Oh, yeah. if you think about it from as well from like a signaling perspective like you obviously have your motor cortex which is sending out these sort of signals to your body to move 
you're increasing the amount of potential signals and the amount of potential movements you can create. For me, that's like a net gain. Who would want yeah. to have restricted signals? Like in my head, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. by just repeating the same movements and not like exploring more, you're kind of just reducing your range, which is essentially what it is, right? But in my head, I don't like the idea of having my like the brain signals being constrained, or well, that's kind of what it technically yeah, yeah. would be doing, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Um it's weird when you put it that way, it kind of makes me no, yeah. it's it's interesting. Yeah. It's just a different. I wonder if that's way, exactly how it works. To look at it. Once again, I don't know if that's exactly how it works, but from my understanding of like signals and stuff, I mean, yeah. this is very like what you're taught at school, right? Type of thing. So I'm, yeah. I'm sure I'm probably butchering it. Somebody can correct me, but um, it's definitely just probably thinking, an essence of truth. In that. Yeah, yeah, probably some level. Yeah, um, yeah. No, it's really interesting. So, animal movements and crawls enhance strength and mobility quadrupedal posture engage um, upper body muscles relieve hip pressure and challenge coordination these movements also align the core and enhance cognitive muscle control they mirror developmental patterns from crawling um, to walking and that's another interesting thing as in like it's almost going back to your like primal basis like your natural like it's very natural for ch um, babies to crawl right and it's almost like you're going back into these kind of positions that you haven't been in for a very long time i mean one of the main stretches that you go to anywhere whether that's yoga or i mean even in like my, my calisthenics you just do like the child's pose right and it's yeah. supposed to be incredibly good for you because it's just a, such a natural natural position um if we constantly move in a symmetrical manner, those neural patterns become ingrained and we lose a large number of movement options as, as a result. It's pretty much exactly what you were saying before. However, there's a risk that movement training focuses solely on ground exercises and, and crawls. For optimal effectiveness, movement training should encompass climbing, hanging, swinging, uh, upright bipedal movements, object manipulation, and swimming. An ideal environment for this uh, type of training might resemble an assault course. So, parkour. The practicality is focused almost exclusively on efficiency of movement. Parkour and free running have now evolved to become two slightly different expressions of the same initial concept. Where parkour is about moving gracefully and efficiently from point A to point B, and free running is more about acrobatic self-expression, performed in a flowing and graceful manner. What this movement training philosophy em emphasizes is that there is no right way to move or to train. One should just start to explore. And I, lo I love this idea that like, you know, why would you some like, what? why would someone has like moved in a particular way and then they've like thought that this is like a, re a really cool physical pursuit to pursue. Or almost and, best practice to some degree. They, just, they yeah. just decided this is the best way to move and we kind yeah. of all then just like locked it in as the uh, the gold standard to some degree. Absolutely. And I just like the that some people have come across this and wanted to innovate movement. I love that. It's like that's kind of our human spirit encapsulated, you know, that we'll find something that no one's ever thought about doing and then someone will just innovate and then the people are like, oh, that's really cool. It's the same thing with like calisthenics. I mean, there's calisthenics where you do pull-ups and stuff and then there's people now doing like flips off the bars yeah. and doing spins and shit like that things that like someone has just taken an extra step towards you know their self-expression and yeah um, i wonder if this is why crossfit and stuff tend to have more um higher rates of injury because if you go too hard too early with these like movements your body's not used to you can obviously cause some damage and therefore I, the whole point of this stuff is like building up slowly in these movements and then obviously once you build up some strength you can start adding some like actual velocity and power for it but I wonder if people like, you know, the high propensity for injuries within these sort of um, sub fitness sections, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. It's caused by the fact they're like, yeah, they've just, they've just gone too hard at a movement their body's not used to. And they've just been caught off basically by the weight. I think that is a big component of it. I think there's also. And they're not doing it correctly as well, obviously. Yeah. I think there's a lot of like sacrifice form of probably. form for speed. Yeah. Because yeah. a lot of it is like it's almost hit, right? You're like you're doing it in like what is it, 50, forty minutes to an hour? That's how they're like uh, workouts normally work. Like it's a workout of the day. That's how mm. it kind of like is structured. But they get a lot in. You're doing a lot of stuff, but a, in a short amount of time. And I think mm. that's also another factor, right? Um, yeah, speed over speed and like carelessness over like actual like slow and form like slow steady. Yeah, yeah, but, yeah. No, exactly. So should we move on to next? Yeah, sorry. I, I did, we, we finished the parkour section. Yes. I didn't, e I didn't even realize. Look at this. Gosh. <laughs> so uh, the evolution 
of movement. So in the functional training Bible, Guido Bruschia emphasizes differentiating between muscle functions and actions. For instance, the adductor brevis action is to adduct the thigh, but its critical function is stabilizing walking. I didn't know that. Understanding functional origins of muscles and muscle groups informs more effective training by addressing real world challenges. Um, and this is actually, do you know what? I think we should probably get this functional training Bible. As yeah, well. I, I uh, added it to the, to the yeah. thing off the back of this because uh especially now with this stuff i need to know what's stabilizing what so i can fix yeah yeah yep. so on in fact, on this note actually i'm gonna start doing more of the the bare feet training so training in bare feet wearing shoes during training disconnects us from the essential proprioception resulting in muscular and neural atrophy diminished strength balance and performance the feet sensory receptors muscle spindles pan pancian corpuscles i guess Cassinian so. corpuscles yeah corpuscles Oh, God. Puzzles. <laughs> I, <love that. laughs> I, I prefer puzzles. I don't know yeah, if that yeah. is it, but let's go for it. And uh, Gol Golgi organ tendons inform us about the ground shape, angle, texture, and more shaping our movements. The flexor halis longus is a mux. Uh, this is yellow, but I'm going to go. It's a muscle that connects to the big toe, which propels us through running and jumping. It can be directly trained to improve jump height, running speed, balance, and more. The flexor digitorum longus, on the other hand, supports the arch, which enhances power generation through the posterior chain by aligning the body and activating the glutes. See, this is just another example, right, of how everything is just so like massively connected. Mm. Um, as as I'm finding out now, with obviously yeah, the ACL, yeah. like how I was saying to you, like just from this one injury i can feel in my calves i can feel in my back a massive difference well it's, it's, it's so your whole body is like a like a massive obviously it is just one big connection right something yeah, yeah. everything's linked to something else and therefore if something's off it's kind of like oh how can we adapt to this the fact this thing's not working anymore yeah well it's it's so funny how your body will compensate for certain movements and it's kind of why oh, i think a large reason why like in chinese medicine the foot is like so important because if you fuck yeah. up that then you compensate at the ankle and then the knee and then the hip joints and then the lower back and then the lower back causes like muscular you know problems. It, you've got, yeah, you've got this uh, <clears throat> also an imbalances. Yes, exactly. Lip, I would, I'm sure, like to be honest, like a large percentage of injuries are caused through some form of imbalance. Mm. I would oh, assume, yeah, yeah, hundred yeah, yeah. percent. Um, so yeah, it's it's a lesson learned now by myself so uh <laughs> the significance lies in the fact that our glutes the body's largest muscles are hindered by the modern cushioned running shoes that encourage unnatural heel striking this just disrupts our natural ball uh yeah ball of foot stride causing us to tip forward preventing us from optimal engagement of these powerful muscles um it's just it's also interesting how like i've come to believe this to some degree but obviously the way are oh, like we've been taught to run and stuff is mm -hmm not uh, what's the best way of putting it not the the best for our body i guess i mean obviously people can perform with hill striking because pretty much 90 percent of people do it if not more. Yeah, yeah yeah and i mean there was some some claims i think in some of these running books claiming that like you know 90 percent of the, the running injuries are caused by the fact we have the wrong gates and yeah, yeah, yeah. none of like imbalances caused by running wearing running shoes but obviously it's it's quite hard to prove that i'm sure but yeah I'm and also like the thing is it. Also, there's like a, okay, we can look at how the body has evolved and maybe that is the right way to run, but also our environments have changed. If we're now running on concrete and our your feet weren't used to, you know, didn't evolve to run on concrete, well, then maybe, maybe there is like an argument for changing up the way that you run to be able to compensate for that, you know? Uh, I still think it's personally that it's the way to run, but I don't think you could do it with those kind of barefoot shoes for a long period of time because there's yeah. so much force. Um, but I'm wondering if that's because we haven't built up the the, the well, maybe. strength, maybe from yeah. repetitive use, you know, to to some degree. Like it once yeah. again, the adaptations take place once there's sort of like micro micro breaks or um, you know stimulus has told your body, oh, oh crap, you need to reinforce this because yeah, this guy is hitting concrete yeah. a lot. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. yeah. I know I'm sure it doesn't communicate in that way, but you know what I mean? It's, it's yeah, yeah. Uh, like a, we need extra resources here because we're getting, we're getting beaten up. Yeah. 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 Precisely. <laughs> no pain, no gain. No um, pain, no gain. So yeah, training outdoors. So outdoor training stimulates the nervous system and strengthens stabilizing muscles in the feet, ankles, and legs. For example, performing pull-ups from a tree branch offers dynamic variations due to the branch branches, unique features, unlike a fixed pull-up bar. I'm going to quickly go off a bit here as well, because that's quite interesting in the sense that if you think about it as well, a bit like the um, the fact that we always do the same plane movements, yeah, yeah. having the same grip orientations 
and like how often in nature do you find like a bar that's exactly, exactly. the same shape exactly the idea of having small variations in your grip is is more i guess you could say is more natural and then also you're going to build up strength in these multiple different other areas right so for example mm-hmm. if you're really strong just do a pull-up bar if you do wide grip or if you start editing the, the ways or the shape of your grip you're going to build up stronger well one stronger grip but also in my head you probably be activating different muscles within your back um, absolutely well like that guy said just before with the ulna digits right like if you have yeah. your pinkies like knuckle over the bar it completely changes how like the lat mm. activation so some grips would probably not allow you that and then maybe it would for the other hand I'm, it's changing. yeah do you know what i'm going to write down here as well to make a note i'm going to look at those fat grips again and see if you've got yeah, like you know yeah. but different variations in size so not just yeah, like the yeah. fat one but like um you know so it can like you can rotate but like every week you're doing a different size one yeah, yeah. i think it's useful to like rotate between the the lot because yeah. i reckon we get to the point where we're super strong in one grip area and then as soon as it gets a bit wider you're like you just struggle you know yeah yeah because um, essentially a grip a grip thing with that as well is also an isometric yeah because you're not doing any rotation for your hands you're just like holding if that makes sense yeah yeah yeah, yeah that, that makes sense like you do lift some weights like this but uh yeah so cold exposure it elicits testosterone re- uh Elicits testosterone release, boosts metabolisms, improves thermoregulation, and potentially serves as a type of discomfort training. The mammalian di- diving response involves applying cold water to the face, activating specialized receptors. This action can lower the heart rate by 10 to 25%, enhance blood flow to vital organs, trigger spleen contraction for increased blood release, and lead to internal pressure adjustments. Um, I remember this because we were talking about like the best way to start a cold shower is just like plunge your face in there. Like, yeah, yeah. Uh, from this perspective, you want that, um, what was it called again? Sorry, the mammalian. The main diving response, response was like, yeah. Diving response, look at that. Um, so yeah, th- take your cold showers. Yeah. Uh, human mobility. So flexibility refers to your ability to get into position with or without an external aid, such as pushing your leg against the beam in order to stretch. Mobility refers to the freedom of movement. What positions can you get into for your strength and control alone? To develop mobility, you need you merely need to move. However, over decades of barely moving, we have learned to move only within limited ranges. For example, if you can raise abduct either leg 90 degrees to the side, why can't you do both at the same time and achieve full splits? Consider that no connective tissue ties the two legs together. The only reason you can't get into the full middle splits position is that your body contracts out of fear in order to protect you from potential injury. Um, I think that's so interesting, isn't it? Yeah, your body's literally like, you've never gone through this range of motion. Please don't. Like, It's not because you can't. It's like, please don't do this. Yeah. Uh, Possibly because it's also too tight or some other level. You put, like realistically, let's be honest. If you did do it, you probably damage yourself. Yes, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but your it's your body's way of saying you haven't learned how to do this yet. No. So let's just let's just stop it before you before you hurt yourself. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Fuck yeah, yeah. yeah. But I don't. Yeah, I mean, it was such an interesting example. example. I'm going to be doing full splits. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be able to just yeah nuts on the ground. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. tea bagging the floor that's it love it um so yeah in Ida Portal's foundational drills for newcomers he introduced introduces dead hangs hanging from a pull-up bar and deep squats into their daily routines he's just starting with a goal of seven minutes of hanging and 30 minutes of squatting each day the resting squ- the resting squat enables deep breathing by avoiding compression of the abdominal cavity allowing the diaphragm to descend further and this, the, this whole idea of like, like seated sort of squats and like holding it and stuff is quite interesting because obviously mm. before chairs, that'd be such a natural movement. And, I, and I'm yeah. pretty sure most people wouldn't be able to do like longer than like... A, like I mean, it's actually so different. Because I remember I used to use that as... I, I remember telling you as my, my squat warm-up. I used, literally yeah. used to sit in a squat for like a minute and just yep. pray for the best. And it was horrible. By the time the minute was finishing, I, I, I could barely get up. Um, but can you imagine some people actually like in the world now still poo like this? Like they, so they I, genuinely like can just. Squat. I want to try and implement yeah. it when I'm like watching TV, where I just like okay. squat. But it is just so fucking difficult. I mean, your just legs aren't used to it. But it's the same thing that they brought up in um, uh, in exercise, right? Like that the Hanumara tribe, or if I've got that right, yeah. um, would just squat. They wouldn't really sit. Yeah. And so they're still engaging some kind of like muscles. They're still like active, you know, even when they're passive, even when they're like not really doing anything. And I think that's like quite important um, just to keep your bodily systems. Cause I think I remember listening to Andrew Huberman and he was saying that there's a mechanism with your calf that if you just like, you know, keep like pushing against the ground, 
with your like foot with the, the ball of your foot so that your calf is like going up and down do it now yeah 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 exactly like i feel like a lot of us do it like when we're sat at a desk or something but essentially that no, no, but like, because your... you told me oh okay <laughs> like, yeah, not because yeah. i naturally not because i naturally uh, right. don't know. i do it all the time and i don't okay. know whether it's like oh, some well no how big I... are your calves bro <laughs> <laughs> bigger uh, i wish they were bigger but um <laughs> I don't know whether it's like a mechanism that your body is like needs to get up and like be active or something, okay. but essentially it's a mechanism that tricks your body into thinking it is active. So you could be sat okay. down, but you're still doing this kind of like raising of your like ankle. Um, and yeah. And so your bodily system is like, okay, we're still being active. Whereas if you stop that, then toxins start to build up. If you're really just sat oh, down and not okay. doing much. Um, yeah. I'm going to try that a lot now. I'm going to look at it like, yeah, I can feel it. Yeah, it's like running a marathon, but just sat, sat on my desk. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, that's literally why those people now get those like kind of like walking like, ah, yeah, desk yeah, things yeah. when they're yeah, yeah. Uh, a little treadmill. Train that endurance. I was thinking yeah. of buying like a bike for my desk so I could just sit here and cycle all day. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> oh, I, love that. I don't know how much I'd use it though. Oh, um, man, yeah. So next part, training the fascia. While individual muscles are distinct, they are encased with a unified connective layer known as a muscle fascia or myofascia. The form of fascia exists throughout the body, forming an elastic connective tissue composed of collagen. Fascia supports and envelops muscle organs, bones, cells, and more, weaving in and out of structures like tendons and aponeuroses. Okay, wow. Uh, this extensive network of viscous uh, membranes imparts tension throughout the body, creating a tensegrity structure. Facial flexibility significantly impacts overall flexibility as tightness in one area affects distant parts of the body. Fascia contains blood vessels, smooth muscle cells, sensory receptors, and even more nerve endings in the muscles. So fascia's role in strength expression, balance, agility involves fascia force trans transmission. It fosters communication between distant muscle groups, facilitating synchronized contractions. Training can alter this force transmission through fibroblast cells that contribute to collagen production and re remodeling in response to stress. Furthermore, muscle fascia might serve as a communication system, aiding electrical signal propagation between muscles and nerve endings, potentially explaining the iridation effect. Movements enhances facial uh, pliability and flexibility, reducing tension and enhancing overall control. Hydration is essential for optimal fascial function, maintaining its elasticity and resilience. Wow, that was a one hell of a big word yeah. dump, wasn't it? Jesus, yeah, yeah. we got through it. Um, <laughs> I, I think it's quite interesting. Like I I know a little bit about the fascia only mostly in, in respect to um my feet because you can get yeah. plantar fasciitis, which is just, okay. you know, the tendon, I think, at the bottom of your foot. Um, but I didn't realize that it was everywhere. And it is interesting because I don't know much about it. And I think there's not actually that much research on it, but there's m more is being done on it. But I think it almost sounds like a kind of suspension kind of mechanism right that like reduces force a bit when you hit something and you can translate that force elsewhere and it's kind of because it's all connected it's almost like i mean like a sort of like spongy type of thing yeah like kind of, yeah exactly it absorbs it and i was wondering just then when you were reading all of that whether you know like tai chi is it tai chi or one of those martial arts where you use the force of the other person against them and you can kind of you know, depending on how you're hit, you can kind of manipulate that and use the force elsewhere. I wonder whether there is an element of that that like kind of brings in the fascia. I don't know, but um, sounds like an interesting concept. Uh, and if you could train that, then I guess, yeah. Train that fascia. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right. So on to the next chapter. So the mind-body connection. Why don't we train our cognitive abilities in the same way that we train our physical ones? embodied cognition. Perhaps the best demonstration of how the mind and body connect comes from the relatively new yet popular theory of embodied co uh, cognition. This theory suggests that many aspects of our cognition are in fact grounded in our physical experience. The fact that the cerebellum is involved in cognition suggests that even when we are grappling with higher level concepts such as philosophy, morality, and theoretical physics, we are still relating everything back to our own physical embodied experiences. I think like in a kind of example of this, although it's a bit of a stretch, but um, the ancient Greeks used to, um, they used to wrestle and okay. it used to be an almost intellectual activity. I think like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu is almost called like the chess of um, martial arts because essentially it's like 
he moves here, I move here. It's very like intellectual, almost like a, almost like a puzzle type thing. Like you know, yeah, yeah. And the uh, ancient Greeks used to basically almost like debate or like take an academic idea and then go and do um, a bit of uh, wrestling after. And it used to be this kind of weird way that you get like a physical experience in as well as an intellectual, as if they're kind of somewhat um, connected. So I wonder whether that's kind of what he's getting at here. Um, training neuroplasticity. So I'm just going to read this bit. Complex movements yield profound growth. Activities involving balance, asynchronous limb movement, and manipulation expands the basal ganglia, potentially enhancing focus and spatial processing. Tracy and Ross Alloway's research reveals that tree climbing, bean walking, and barefoot running boost working memory. Tasks blending proprioception, planning, orientation, and calculation, uh, calculation offer excellent mental workouts. An example of this is like... Um, this unnamed child suffering from poor language comprehension, awkward handwriting and muddled speech. He attended the special school called the Arrowsmith School, set up by Barbara Arrowsmith Young, where he was asked with tracing detailed images. This training quickly enhanced his ability to speak in longer sentences, communicate effectively with others and generally demonstrate greater verbal fluency. And I've come across this kind of point with handwriting and how the importance of handwriting because especially when you, you know understanding what you're writing because you're you're embodying it you're doing the physical movement you're actually like um you're you're writing it's kinetic at the end of the day and so it's opposed to that link between what you're writing and the actual cognitive cognitive aspect of it is kind of bonds a lot more um okay. cultivating ambidextrousness can enhance plasticity and thicken crucial brain regions like the corpus callosum. One of the best ways to train ambidexter uh, ambidexterity is to practice cursive with the non-dominant hand. Um, I just wrote "Hello, my name is" in with my left hand, and it was very, oh mate, uh, embarrassing. I've uh, tried to do I'm this actually, recently. Yeah, what well, so every difficult. day you try and write something? Is it a well, little bit? Like I've got an idea of like just seeing how you can. Yeah, exactly. Basically, do like a month improvement. Just see yep. every day write the same sentence repeat yeah. it maybe 10 times and just yeah. see if you can get your handwriting to improve over time yeah i'm intrigued to see if it yeah. works genuinely i'm gonna i might actually try it. i might put on my daily habits to do i've heard yeah like that's what i try to do with my journaling but i've, I've heard that when you train a physical skill in the non-dominant hand it actually yeah. also improves the right one because you almost your default uh, is you... to use like okay in my case my right hand to do a skill okay. And when I do my left, my right is still learning, but it's just my left is doing the skill aspect of it, and that is learning it as well. So both okay. apparently get better. I'm no way. I'm actually. I'm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna try it for months. See what happens. Yeah. 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 Genuinely. Um, okay. So visualization and mental rotation. So you can enhance your visualization skills through various methods. Engaging in computer games can boost spatial awareness, while image streaming, a technique pioneered by Win Wenger, PhD can also be effective. Simply close your eyes, allow your imagination to flow and describe the evolution, uh, evolving um, imagery allowed. This has been shown to heighten the uh, vividness of the mind's eye. Improving working memory and practicing mental object rotation are other valuable strategies for refining spatial ability. So you can understand how improving spatial ability might actually help you when in your environment to be like functional. Um, so last bit here, so dual end back training is one of the only forms of brain training game that is backed by a considerable body of research. It tasks with spotting sequences of numbers or letters in a grid and identifying repetitions that happen a certain amount of moves later, um, earlier, not immediately. Oh, it's just like training working memory then, my head or training yeah. like short term memory type stuff. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Interesting. Yeah. Nice. So we'll move on to the next chapter, which is enhancing plasticity for skills and intelligence. So neurons that fire together wire together and neurons that fire apart grow apart. OK, that's quite a nice little phrase, isn't it? It's very, um, what's his bloody name? Andrew Huberman. I, <laughs> I like, it's such I like a common phrase at uni. I yeah. remember like they would is always it? be that like neurons that fire together wire together. It's just, yeah, it's because it's got a bit of like poetry to it, you know, yeah, it just, exactly. you just sound like a bit of a, a don. Right. So. Yeah. When you consistently perform one action followed by another, a new connection between those action forms. This is the essence of skill learning. Repetitive execution of linked movement patterns, creating new neural pathways encoded in your DNA as procedural memory. 
Yet this process can hinder us too, as deeply ingrained patterns are challenging to untangle. This is referred to as negative plasticity. During actions, we contrast our envisioned ideal movement with the actual execution, e.g. a golf swing. Meeting or surpassing expectations triggers positive hormones, fortifying the neural pathways. Conversely, a missed shot releases a distinct neurochemical mix, constituting a prediction error. This cascade enhances attention and alertness, aiding future performance. The pathway for the incorrect movement is, isn't uh, solidified, solidified, sorry. And that actually just, it kind of makes a lot of sense, right? Through just, yeah. uh, what's the word, like experiential, you know, just, just for going through your life. I feel like, uh, you know, if you're playing football, for example, you shoot, you score, you feel great because you've hit it on yeah. target. You shoot, yeah. you miss, you immediately feel a bit crap. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I, I do find it interesting as well with the idea of like missing the the the, the shot or missing the pattern or the ideal mm. pattern or ideal result leading to a uh, higher attention. I think yeah. that's quite interesting. The and it makes sense. Reward would, prediction error, isn't it? Yeah, it would make sense where you'd pay more attention to then yeah. uh, to then try and analyze, you know, what's gone wrong and how to improve kind of thing or become more aware yeah. to... Um, to change basically because yeah, when you're yeah. more aware you have the you have the ability to go in and try and fine tune yeah you know what was maybe missing whereas obviously if you just repeat the same motor pattern without thinking about it um that allows no change right so yeah kind of absolutely <laughs> um and then skill acquisition so pavel oh my jesus what the hell is that satsalini satsalini i'm like i'm so bad at like anything that's not english <laughs> <laughs> anything with awkward like letters i'm just like what the hell? i mean that is like, an awkward yeah, name so yeah 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 pavel tozzolini practice of greasing the groove emphasizes the rehearsing of movement over and over again in order to refine the neural pathways i mean it kind of makes sense with anything right yeah you know, like you get the, fo the foundational movements you kind of you learn and then you repeat again and again and again until it yeah. becomes second nature so you could integrate this approach by doing sets of three to five pull-ups multiple times daily in a week you'd accumulate numerous repetitions without straining your muscles similarly you could apply this strategy within a workout spanning uh spanning a start middle and end with comprehensive movement mapping um yeah i saw that as kind of like a spaced repetition um yeah. aspect to like attitude towards fitness which i thought yeah, was yeah. Weird. i mean i was gonna say you could technically uh obviously you have to have the the gym equipment but i like the idea of doing the sort of space pull-ups and mm. you know not creating that muscle fatigue but you're training the movement if you do it a couple yeah. of times a day especially yeah. if somebody like starting like for example I, I feel like with the recovery from obviously the acl stuff I reckon that's going to be my approach to like fitness instead of just doing one big session of like 40 minutes it's going to be like throughout the day every time i like get up let's just do five squats yeah, yeah. Let's do five whatever and just yeah. you're because you the whole point for that is not even just the strength is the retraining the movement yeah exactly um, and therefore that's the you know the goal if that's the goal then you probably should not fatigue your muscles you should just do one or two reps and be really present and try and get them done yeah, it's, uh, yeah. mapping the movements in your brain so yeah. that you can access them much better essentially yeah and this is the bit that i love because this sits really well with me as a gamer myself so computer games are one such way to boost global brain connectivity by st uh, st simulating novel environments and rules necessitating the acquisition of new motor skills but also in my head it uh, necessitates the the new sort of mapping of like strategies and stuff so for mm -hmm. example not just the motor skills because when it's like gaming it's kind of depending upon if you play like a playstation or like a like a, a pc or whatever yeah. you you're kind of constrained in like the finger movements right like fair yeah, enough yeah, it yeah. does create new mappings of the finger like dexterity i guess you could say but for me it's more the actual like novel environments novel strategies novel like you're you're learning to like come to understand a new game to then understand the strategies to implement etc i think yeah, yeah. i mean the whole idea of like novel experiences and learning and stuff i think is obviously very in my head at least good for um yeah, bro, bro, I guess you could say brain stimulation or yeah. even yeah. all Yeah, it's problem solving, your strategy, yeah. all of those things. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Okay, so on to the next chapter then. Um, yep. Self-mastery and physical intelligence. So physical intelligence encompasses the skill to recognize and influence physical factors, including chemicals that impact mental state, mood, and efficiency. It's closely tied to intro reception, the ability to sense one's bodily condition. An integral aspect of assessing bodily states is the parent and sympathetic nervous system, which regulates ver uh, various bodily systems, including mood affecting um, hormones and chemical reactions. And we've talked about the parent and sympathetic nervous system a lot, but essentially it's just the fight or flight to a degree. And, you know, you can, you, when, when the sympathetic nervous system is engaged, you're somewhat stressed and normally you know, 
you don't you want it to be acute because it, it, it does play like um uh, an important function in telling you okay you know beware of this but if it's chronic and consistent that stress builds up loads of hormones and it's really un, uh, you know yeah. unhealthy for you um it's an emotional balance not just a muscular imbalance right? absolutely yeah. absolutely part of physical intelligence is realizing emotions might stem from factors beyond initial perceptions instead of reacting impulsively consider if fatigue hunger or unrelated stress could be influencing this insight helps restore balance by addressing underlying chemistry this also demonstrates the close link between physical intelligence and emotional intelligence. And a lot of this is kind of almost self-awareness. It's like if you train your body to be more in tune, and we've talked about this with like, um, what was it? Um, oh, I can't remember what it was now, but essentially just being more in tune with yourself and listening to yourself and not being um, reliant ooh. on like, Good to go, I think. It was talking about yeah, like, yeah, yeah, recovery exactly. techniques. It kind of like basically summarised all recovery techniques is listen to your body kind of thing, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> so no, absolutely. In one sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So exactly. The, the better you are at that, the more you train that ability, the more you can be like, okay, maybe this is impacting my social life or maybe this is impacting my emotional reactions. You know, I know what the factor is despite the external ones. I can look inwards and be like, okay, this might be affecting me. Um how our thoughts determine our physiological state danger doesn't have to be present for the idea of it to impact on your mental and physical state as a result cognitive restructuring is important to try and reduce the level of stress we experience this is an example of metacognition thinking about thinking that aims to remove negative thought patterns and still more positive coping mechanism two strategies that commonly are employed are thought challenging and hypothesis testing um, and I've come across that in like CBT stuff. So you have formulations and oh, what is it? Yeah, I think it's formulations. Yeah, essentially like you identify a kind of belief and you're mm. like about the way that you behave in the world. And then so this is what happens if I was to do this. But then you test that belief. And if you do it and that thing that you predict doesn't happen, then your belief changes. And that's the whole idea of kind of like trying to change your perceptions mm. about yourself or the world or you know and try and align them with like a healthier goal mm -hmm. um a persistent source of stress can stem from social pressure the constant concern about others opinions this is often exacerbated by social emphasis on outward appearances to confront this social anxiety engage uh, engaging in comfort challenges could offer a promising solution so exactly using these kind of belief changing um techniques to be like oh everyone's watching me if i was to do this you know they'd all laugh at me and then you go out onto the street and do something silly and no one does it and it starts to change that perception of how you yeah. see other people um tai chi seamlessly blends meditation and martial elements revolving around movement and embracing a kinetic meditation approach yeah nice so we move on to the next chapter i think I, before i even do that it's, it's worth realizing that I think we said this at the beginning, but this book is not even just the fitness, right? It's actually yeah. evolved from just fitness to like actual mental performance. It's like the link between everything. Like, I mean, I guess it's called super functional training for a reason. It's not just like mm. the functions of your body, it's the functions of your mind too, right? Exactly. Um, I mean, this point right he really here, goes deep. He goes really deep into this sort of stuff, you know, like it's, it's yeah. not just, it's not just training. It's literally like mental stuff as well. So no, absolutely. And th like the point just there, that's, tai chi you know trains that meditation that self-awareness ability to look inside and be like okay maybe this is impacting me maybe you know my perceptions mm. are wrong and it's just like almost a uh well it's a kinesthetic approach to mindfulness you know you could yeah. do it through yoga but you can also do it in a more like kind of physical way like through tai chi in this in this case um yeah yes so we've got ultimate states of human performance so you've got getting into flow in a flow state the prefrontal brain region quiets down leaving only areas for immediate decisions active called transient hypofrontality while it may seem that the prefrontal cortex is silent due to minimal usage it's operating with exceptional efficiency with our brain's energy reserve allowing activation of only about three percent of this matter at a time dispersing it across numerous tasks leads to performance decline this underscores the importance of quieting in a monologue which can disrupt the flow state. Flow hinges on the fine line between stress and calm as demanding situations require undivided attention. Striking the right balance uh, prevents triggering an overpowering fight-or-flight response that impairs the prefrontal cortex. 
Um, then we've got owl eyes. So dubbed wide angle vision or owl eyes. This technique embraced by Native Americans and survivalists involves consciously engaging peripheral vision. By expanding awareness beyond a single focal point, oh, that's weird. It enhances present moment processing as peripheral inputs reach the brain 25% faster than focal inputs. <laughs> Every mental state has value, and a truly optimized brain is one that can easily switch between these states to enjoy optimum performance for the given situation. Um, Such an odd really thing, right? Yeah. yeah, the moment you actually just like, you realize you just like sort of zoom out, and you're like, whoa, there's way more to the world than just yeah, you yeah. Know, the straight ahead. It's uh yeah. It's worth probably practicing a couple of times a day, you know? Oh, absolutely. I think there's, we definitely fall into this kind of approach to the body where like, oh, this is a biological thing. This is what, this is how I'm made. And there isn't a way to improve this. Mm. Whereas like you don't normally think about it because everyone, if they've got bad eyesight, for example, they just get glasses, right? You don't think about like, well, the muscle is an eye. Like, can I train this? You know, can I improve this? There probably is an element that you can, maybe not like a hundred percent, but there probably is always an element where you can like improve at something. In this case, you know, your peripheral vision. I would never have thought about training that. And then, yeah, here we are. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna be like a fucking horse, you know. You're just That's like it. looking at this. I'm gonna turn into an owl, man. You're yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, lovely. So, next chapter is energy, the ultimate force multiplier. We've we've uh, briefly touched on the kind of systems in different books, but broadly yeah. speaking, there are three different um different energy systems employed by the body. These are the ATP creatine system, um, aka the phosphocreatine system. And there's the glycogen lactic acid system, aka lactic acid systems or glyco uh, glycolytic system. And then there's the aerobic system. For example, when sprinting, your body initially used the ATP creatine system, breaking down stored ATP in the muscles to produce usable energy, releasing energy in the form of ADP and P uh, pi, adenosine diphosphate and phosphate molecule the atp stored in muscles depletes after about three seconds of exertion thankfully the body can recycle used pi and adp back into atp using um, phosphocreatine produced mainly in the kidneys by utilizing creatine the body uh, the body is able to exert maximum power output for a further eight to ten seconds gosh what a long time if you continue running beyond 11 to 13 seconds, the body shifts to the lactic acid system for energy. This involves like glycolysis, breaking glycogen into glucose, then pyruvate, and finally ATP. It can also use blood glucose, resu uh, resulting in byproducts like lactate, uh, lactate and hydrogen ions. Lactate is not just a hindrance, it's valuable as it converts back to pyruvate and glucose in the liver. Training enhances this conversion efficiency while, um, while effective. This process is gradual, leading to lactate accumulation in the blood during sustained exertion. And then finally, after 30 seconds to three minutes, the aerobic system takes over. This system taps into stored fat energy requiring oxygen transport to muscle. Um, transport to muscles thus breathing becomes heavier the heart gets to work and we slow into a steady pace for the rest of the run it's just interesting to see how like your body transitions into these different phases based on the kind of fitness that you're doing and how and it's very like what um uh oh what's the guy who who was talking with andrew human andy something oh god galpin andrew galpin. Andy Gal andy galpin. Yeah, yeah 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 exactly and great podcast series I yeah say really recommend that um and he was talking a lot about this and he's like you know once one again once again once you understand the fundamentals and the components that build up you know make up different energy systems then you can be like okay well how do i focus on this how do i fix yeah, on how do I special physical action yeah yeah um so training each system so various training types target specific energy systems. Notably, the three energy systems align with the three twitch muscle fiber types. Aerobic activates predominantly engage slow twitch fibers, and the inverse holds true. Um, High-intensity interval training, so this involves alternating between anaerobic intense exercise and active recovery periods. This approach is effective for fat loss and uh, as the high-intensity phases deplete immediate energy, necessitating fat utilization for subsequent energy expenditure. Additionally, it enhances mitochondrial density, boosting energy production efficiency. 
Um, lung training, enhancing endurance and VO2 max can involve training the lungs directly by targeting the intercostal muscles and diaphragm. Techniques like breathing through a straw or using inspiratory uh, muscle training can effectively strengthen these respiratory components. Um, and then low intensity steady state. So is particularly effective meanwhile for strengthening the heart and developing Qmax, which is quantified maximal cardiac output. That's because training the heart rate at a lower pace ensures that it will have time to fully relax between beats. That's interesting. Which in turn means you are able to grow like any other muscle. Enhancing your ability to efficient, uh, efficiently transport oxygen and energy to targeted body parts, not only boosts your overall energy, but also sharpens mental alertness and focus. Yeah, it's quite interesting that. But once again, it's just really tapping into that idea that he mentioned at the very beginning, this kind of like ATSP hierarchy, like focus, find those, do your research, find those phys like underlying physical attributes and focus on those things. You know, w once you understand how the muscles work, how the energy systems work, you know, you can start to use those at your disposal. Mm -hmm. um, anaerobic threshold trading. The anaerobic threshold marks the shift from aerobic to anaerobic processes linked to the quantity and um, efficacy of your cellular mitochondria. You can activate it by finding your threshold and doing activities like a threshold run. Identifying this threshold is often marked by chal uh, challenges in maintaining com conversation due to heightened exertion. So that's kind of what um, that Andrew Huberman talks about when he's like running at zone two, just so you can just about like hold a conversation um it's funny i went for a run yesterday with my mate chris and uh at the beginning i could hold a conversation then towards the end i was quite tight i was also quite yeah. hungover but um yeah Never it was helps. quite difficult no not not quite um the term lactate threshold or lactate inflection point is often used interchangeably with the anaerobic threshold, but it signifies the point where lactate accumulation exceeds removal rate. It's a spectrum where energy processes turn increasingly anaerobic and different exercises have varying lactate inflection points. The prevailing opinion oppose, uh, opposes heavy reliance on threshold training, often termed black hole training. This approach involves monotonous single pace training, accumulating junk miles. Critics like Ben Greenfield, who's the guy who wrote Boundless, he's a bit of a biohacker, I think, yeah. um, argue that it emphasizes only one energy system, potentially leading to overtraining and chronic health issues. And I think that's probably an interesting point that like, if you understand in this case, like what muscles or what energy systems are being utilized in an exercise, then if you take the approach that this whole book is trying to emphasize that like training multiple different things, then you might want to go for the exercise that um, targets all three rather than just one. Yeah. As once again, it's never sort of like focusing just on one, you know, like once again, it's trying to optimize all different systems, right? Like, yeah, yeah. In fact, just knowing there's three, I mean, it should be like, you should be, I don't know if you should break it up evenly, but obviously you should always be no, trying yeah. to train the efficiency and I guess, yeah, of all of them. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, work capacity and resistance cardio. Work capacity signifies your capacity to sustain desired output across sessions while st still recuperating effectively for the next. It's shaped by factors like aerobic fitness, mitochondria, VO2 max, lactate threshold, capillary development, glycogen reserves, mental resilience, economy of movement, and muscle fiber engagement. The skeletal muscle pump involves muscles acting as micro hearts, compressing embedded veins to intensify circulation and drive blood to the heart. Conversely, muscle relax relaxation can draw blood into muscles due to um, pressure differentials. Effective resistance training can become cardio when using the right weight. Extremely heavy weights can lead to quick fatigue, while mid-range weights enable higher rep ranges to challenge energy systems, improving lactic threshold and more. Um, kettlebells and battle ropes offer optimal resistance. Battle ropes involve repetitive slamming, allowing force, uh, forceful ballistic or rhythmic exertion. Compound body weight exercises like push-ups force the heart to enhance circulation. High volume push-ups or sit-ups serve as cardio boosting endurance and muscle growth effectively. So I think this whole section, I mean, like it's quite dense in the sense that it's quite like a lot to do with the, um, uh, a lot to do with how the body works and kind of on a much like lower scale. Um, 
but essentially it's just re-emphasizing the point that once you know about this stuff you can kind of see how it all links with each other and then follow I mean, that kind yeah, of rabbit hole you know you can also create like uh, programs or exercises absolutely like targeting each sort of area if that makes yeah. sense yeah. And I don't think it needs to get to a point where you're obsessive and be like, oh, I can't do this because it's got to, it's going to lead to that and that's going to lead to this, you know. But I think it just gives you an overall idea of how the body works and how there are so many parameters to manipulate to get the kind of desired effect that you want. Yeah. Um, so last bit here. So metabolic conditioning. Metabolic conditioning employs movements like press-ups and kettlebell swings in circuit fashion with brief intervals for enhanced endurance and weight loss. The objective is to limit recovery, keeping heart rate elevated and challenging energy systems. By alternating exercises such as push-ups, pull-ups, kettlebell swings and tuck jumps for short bursts of maximum effort, we achieve metabolic conditioning. Intentional shunting, such as switching between upper and lower body moves, further challenges the heart optimizing circulation. I really like that point. That's a that's an interesting point. Um, this approach combines endurance training with various benefits like core, uh, core stability, mobility, and grip strength enhancement through exercises such as kettlebell swings, lizard crawls, and offset loaded carries. Yeah. Yes. Very dense. Yeah, yeah, quite a dense chapter, I think that one. But all the nonetheless, it's very useful. So it's mm. definitely worth knowing about the energy systems and obviously how it works and the the ranges that you need to be operating in. I feel like everybody sort of like you know probably neglects to some degree one aspect of their energy systems. I, yes, you know, most training programs tend to because um, obviously if you're going to the gym, like you said before, to focus on aesthetics, they tend to you know sort of ignore the sort of hit style and mm. cardio based training, um, which is obviously very important. And I think it's probably good to, I think a lot of people would like more energy. Mm -hmm. um, and we naturally resort to thinking that it's to do with our diet and maybe a large portion Part of it, it is, yeah. you know, maybe it's like, oh, maybe we shouldn't have carbs first because then that creates a glucose spike and I'll be tired later or whatnot. But then there's probably also an element where, well, maybe if I train, maybe I've only been focusing on one kind of energy system and I haven't been tapping into the others and maybe they will give me a bit more energy, like especially in the evenings when I want to be a bit more productive, but I'm feeling really like, you know, um, slow. Yeah. You know? And to be honest, it's quite interesting as well, just thinking about like the talk or he was saying there that like, you can actually train the sort of hit exercises without necessarily doing sort of like mm. running. You can actually train yeah. the hit through muscle-based exercises as long as you're basically getting the heart rate up to the point where it needs to like compensate so like if you just went absolutely ham on some press-ups you're gonna be you know get yeah hit, getting into that sort of uh, energy system exactly. exactly anything where you can't like sort of uh get enough oxygen etc quick enough or um i'm gonna have to bear that in mind as well for when i do my comeback because i'm thinking like you know without being able to run yeah it's just going you're gonna you're gonna see videos of me man just yeah like i'm actually i'm actually gonna create a um a rocky style uh eye of the tiger inspired video but you should just create an instagram <laughs> it's like jess's yeah. return you know the dark yes, horse um, jesus jesus is coming back just exactly jess messiah 2.0 um <laughs> yeah yeah no it's 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 good it's just like and it's once again it's pretty simple it's like you're just tweaking what you're already doing but just to hit different mm -hmm. areas you know yeah, yeah. Um, another tool and at your disposal exactly this is the, the pretty much the whole point of this book really mm -hmm. in my head is to like learn the principles and then you can create the, like the sort of the you can adapt the principles to your workout routine as it already Precisely. stands yeah, um, yeah. or if not add some ad additions etc yeah but yes okay the one of the last two chapters now so we've got the integration becoming super functional so the atsp hierarchy our focus should be on selecting exercises that offer maximum value in developing multiple traits and attributes these are the super traits that serve as foundations for many over others so slow commotion or slow and mechanically disadvantaged movement is about it's the innovative training program approach to design uh designed to enhance strength and control access uh control across unpredictable angles maximizing the utilization of various traits and attributes sam dam as he calls it involves extremely slow locomotive style free, uh, freestyle movements aimed at developing muscle uh, mind muscle connection core stability endurance and mobility all in one style of training it, make, it makes sense doesn't it that's basically just time over tension right? yeah like you're doing these planes. things across different planes but like the longer you take the more force you are accumulating essentially yeah um 
So you've got here the four practice modes, uh, ground Samdam, bipedal Samdam, climbing Samdam, and manipulation Samdam. Slow, slow commotion fosters these benefits by deliberately slowing down complex movements and challenging yourself from various angles, improving weak points and enhancing powerful movement from any position. Sam Samdam acts as a valuable binding agent to address angles and postures often unaddressed by even functional exercises. Approach Samdam gradually and mindfully as these positions challenge your custom weight distribution. So you've got overcoming gravity isometrics. I, isometric, sorry. To enrich this training pro, uh, approach, consider integrating additional movement varieties like controlled explosive parametrics from strong and stable stances that briefly contrast with the deliberate pace or exploring overcoming isometrics. The missing attributes within the ATSP system refers to the physical traits that are often overlooked in conventional training approaches. These include lateral shoulder rotation, thoracic spine extension mobility, and uh, straight arm strength. That's a good point about straight arm strength. Mm. Yeah. It's not something we train, is it? Um, no, well, calisthenics you kind of do, but it's very difficult. I mean, you have to be quite advanced to be able to do that, I feel. Obviously, depending yeah. on the exercise, but yeah. So next we've got sequencing. So for optimal muscle fatigue, the strategy is straightforward. Position intricate and challenging exercises at the workouts on set and reserve simple ones for later. This approach prioritizes complexity and nervous system fatigue over mere weight or load. Complex multi-joint, multi-planar, or heavy exercises lead the routine, while closed chain, light, or isolated movements wrap it up, suitable for higher volume. I mean, Thomas, this is how I personally been training yeah, for a while yeah, now, where yeah. it's like the sort of com compound movement, et cetera, starts at the beginning, and then you slowly mm -hmm. get to the point where you're just you're doing the classic tricep extensions at the end. Um, Precisely. Mechanical drop sets. To achieve this, lower the weight upon reaching failure and continue. The same principle applies to various movement patterns. In a mechanical drop set, you modify the mechanics of movement during the set when you hit failure. For instance, transitioning from regular push-ups to knee push-ups after reaching the limit. And I thought that's quite an interesting mm, point. Yeah. If you learn the actual mechanics, you don't actually have to reduce just the weight. You can reduce the form, which I thought is Precisely, an interesting Yeah, point. it's an interesting... It's Once again, it's just another component that you can manipulate but for some reason mm -hmm. we just don't think about that when we're at the gym it's like oh yeah. no the only component i could change is it's is the other weights weight. yeah it's it's not you've got so much to, to do especially for body weight stuff like it's um yeah absolutely yeah. and then you've got here so the interference effect so the interference effect simply states that training in different modalities will often cause one type of training to interfere with the other is a common argument used against functional training and would apply doubly to super functional training However, this doesn't mean we should limit ourselves to just one type of training. Striving to excel in a single area may not be practical for most non-athletes. It's important to shift away from that mindset. Furthermore, many adaptions, the adaptations from various disciplines can complement rather than interfere with each other. The extent of interference depends on the nature and intensity of the training program. With intelligent design, these challenges can be navigated. Thanks to epigenetics, we understand that achieving a certain level of strength for endurance once can facilitate returning to that point more easily. When you recognize the gaps in each type of training and borrow concepts from other areas to plug them in, you can start to become a true all-rounder. Moreover, you'll be developing a training style that is unique to you. But yeah, I think we touched on this interference effect mm. earlier on in the um, podcast, and I even said yeah. something on the lines of... Um, I can't remember what we were saying. I think we were saying that obviously people get that like in their head, like they don't want to do cardio when they're doing like a weight training routine because yeah, yeah. they're scared their gains will go. But then, you know, I like to think after listening to this, if, you're, if, if you are still listening, it's... you you should be now sold more maybe even if it's slower like a slower and steadier approach to fitness where you're actually increasing across a way broader range of movement than just yeah. you know being absolutely jacked on the bench but the moment yeah. you get asked to sort of dance you just act like a robot you know yeah yeah no precisely i think it's so important and i think it is just we we slip into this idea as if we pick techniques from people who are the best at that sport but they are the best at that sport because they are you know they're competing against the best professionals in the world you know and why would we why would we measure ourselves to that to it to an extent i mean like yes okay you can obviously adopt a lot of their techniques but you don't need to do it in such a specialized manner um because you're not competing or most people aren't competing you know um i think once again it's the um it's the effect of like uh, the expectations of having everything immediately right now. Yeah, yeah. People don't like the idea of, you know, oh, wow, if I accident, if I if I do the multiple areas, I'm never going to finish the one area that I want the most. Yeah. And then people, I think, misunderstand the nature of the sort of like training as well. It's like, mm -hmm. I mean, if you just go to the gym and just do like, you know, biceps or something, you might have big arms, but the rest yeah. of your body's going to look so out of proportion yeah. anyway. So yeah. you might as well try and do it all at once. And yeah. 
build up functionality and not just aesthetics because you could build both at the same time right like this yeah. is the point yeah. it's like um and prevent injuries as well so yeah yeah no 100% um and realistically yeah because you like build up you, you get pretty built anyway doing a lot of this stuff i actually think it looks better and it looks more like more proportional despite mm. people might be aiming for proportion when doing like you know aesthetics in a weird way they neglect so many other aspects because they're not thinking about function. And so they aren't proportional in some regards. Um, yeah. So last chapter, what will you become? So there are things called micro workouts and these consist of 10 to 20 minute workouts that allow you to stay active throughout the day. They also tap into the concept of movement mapping or greasing the groove, which we kind of uh, touched on earlier. Um, you can incorporate them for extended training periods or substitute them for a single workout. In the latter case, the same workload is accomplished, but in shorter intervals. That especially is the case if you're like just busy and you just don't have time because it's very easy. And I think you mentioned this um, earlier on in the podcast that, you know, it's either all or nothing, right? Like mm. you either go for an hour at the gym or if you can't do that, then you just don't go at all. And I used to slip into that. Mm. Um, you can have micro bakes can't you, you could like if you, yeah, for example yeah. if you're working and you can do like body weight related exercises you can do like little mini micro workouts throughout the day just dot yeah. three of them in and then you've done a workout of an hour length but just different times and you'll probably have more energy to lift heavier or yeah. do more you know? yeah no it's a good point um the modular approach instead of writing workouts consider writing a list of specific traits that appeal to you what do you want to work toward what trait uh, what traits matter to you and your goals now select exercises and techniques that will train the specific physical attributes related to those traits so those underlying things that we talked about at the very beginning of this podcast then take each of those blocks of moves and train them either on their own or combined into longer workouts incidental training um yeah Strive to transform daily tasks into training opportunities. As we identify our desired attributes and their various training methods, we can recognize chances emerging in our everyday routines. The idea of returning to a natural way of life by going back to our roots is flawed. It assumes a consistent history when in reality we've adapted to numerous environments throughout our existence, including our present one. And I think just to touch on that, it's almost like, if you start to train functionally, you can put yourself into new environments that you wouldn't normally and therefore adapt even further. So you're almost seeking out new environments to adapt even further and be more efficient, um, which I quite like. Uh, in, uh, so last point here. So instead of designing our environments to make life easier for us, what if we design them to offer more challenge, play and opportunity for creative expression? And I think it's an interesting point. Like, you know, it may not always be feasible and you know, I'm not going to leave my house and just start walking on all fours, but <laughs> there is an element of like, maybe if we change, <laughs> yeah, maybe if we change the way that we perceive ourselves and how we move throughout life and start to see opportunities where you can introduce some of the things that he's talked about in this book and that we've talked about on this podcast to just, introduce them i was saying earlier on before this podcast that i was on the tube yesterday and i just randomly started to balance on one foot and i was like training my balance right by just being on a tube but it, i don't i didn't need to do that but you see how like the option is there yeah maybe but the, like, the, the point being as well in some like the point being with that example as well is you weren't really doing anything anyway so like yeah. these opportunities yeah, 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 where yeah. your mind's yeah. wandering you, you you could almost count it it's not wasted time but you know if, if for example in terms of you're waiting to get to a destination maybe some people like to go on their phones play video games whatever mm -hmm. like read what whatnot um it's just another prime opportunity where you could actually add something in which increases your balance stability movement i mean yeah. obviously we're not i mean <laughs> you can if you want you could get up and do yeah. some weird like sort of like movement routine of like yep. dance but i mean <laughs> i'm sure social social embarrassment will probably come into play but obviously balance, balancing one leg like a flamingo unless like, you'd be fine yeah in my head Unless, of course, oh, yeah. you start putting your leg up. <laughs> you yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Make it subtle, right? It's uh, <laughs> the point. Like, we're going yeah. to create a movement, man. It's going to be the flamingo yeah. movement. Yeah, the flamingo yeah. boys and girls. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. The cheap flamingos. So, the cheap flamingos. Flamingos with blue shirts. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Um, yeah, so that was Functional Training and Beyond. Really interesting book. Kind of just 
introduce you to a lot of concepts that you haven't you maybe come across but you haven't given much given much time or thought Mm -hmm. and i think it does you know it definitely has shown me that being functional for me is is more important you know i can be as i can work on aesthetics through function and there's also just more fun like one of the main things that i found from doing calisthenics is that there's more forms of progression it's not just weight so it introduces like some other level of variability and kind of more goals and i like that it's just for me it's more fun because it's like okay yeah i could go up and wait or i could do more reps but i could also change the movement and it makes it more difficult and i think a lot of these introduce that kind of elements where there's just more stuff to work on um yeah yeah i think as well for, for me it's just this idea of you know giving you principles giving you new ideas you can go and adapt to your current workout program if you're if you're currently working out but also if you're not it gives you a good foundation to like start developing your own workout program Mm. and you know you kind of the thing i like the most about the book is it obviously just gives you this freedom it's like here's the tools here's some ideas here's what you could do with the movement patterns etc here's the tools you can use in sense of like sandbags whatever yeah just go out like it almost it almost encourages like yeah creativity and just trying like it's like there's no wrong way to move yeah in in that sense there's just like multiple different ways and different angles that people probably don't train and if you can maximize your range of movement whilst also being strong through them like that's that's fitness that's functional fitness at least yeah yeah. um absolutely so yeah i mean if you enjoyed the podcast i'd definitely say pick up the book because it doesn't do justice to the sort of nitty gritty deep like tactics and workout uh, routines and also understanding the energy systems because we have to gloss mm. over it for the sake of uh, longevity. So yeah, um, definitely would recommend reading it if you're into fitness. One of the better books. Well, one of the most eye-opening books because in comparison to the other ones, it was quite not constrained, but you get, you get, I mean, they kind of like answer yeah, one yeah. question, whereas this guy's coming up with like tools that you can use. And yeah, I would definitely recommend it. Yeah. He's also got a website where he has a bit of a blog and also some um, content that you can buy, which I think you have, we've, Jess, don't we've, you? Yeah, we've got well, the we course. Bought, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and that's over at uh, thebioneer.com. Has some really interesting stuff, kind of like what he's touched on in the book, but some of it just goes into a bit more depth. Um, yeah. Because this book yeah. was released a couple of years ago now, so he's got some like, new yeah. changes, et cetera, since. So I definitely think worth he's got he's got a second book doesn't he the adapt adaptive training i think building a body that's fit for function yeah 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 so definitely go and check it out if you want to um obviously the book summary will be online and along with the actionable ideas so go and check that out i think i don't know what we're doing next Oh, psychology of totalitarianism i think yeah bit, bit of a di- bit of a different topic but yeah uh, but it's you know. something that's probably going to stir up some aggression yeah exactly or like some, some controversial some that, yeah that's it love it i'm excited for it yes yeah me too so uh yeah until next time we'll catch that's you then right. Bye. that is a wrap Hey guys, well there you have it. We hope you enjoyed that book summary. Now we know it can be a lot to take in all at once, so if you want to be able to read this in a more palatable size, or you want to be able to implement any of those key actionable ideas that we were talking about in this episode, head on over to our website at wisewords.blog where the book summary will be waiting for you. Also, don't forget to check out our socials as we consistently upload the key ideas, benefits and actionable ideas from all the books that we read. The links to those will be in the description below. Now, we want to be able to get you the best content in a way that's really easy to understand, but we need your help. Your opinion matters. So you are our feedback mechanism. And with those quick actions, whether that's leaving us a like or a dislike, commenting in the comment section below or subscribing to our channel, all of those help us gauge what we're doing well and how to improve on our method of delivery. So if you have any thoughts on the matter, don't hesitate to act. It takes less than 10 seconds and it really helps us out. But with all that being said, 